Content warning. This video contains extended, intense discussions of mental health and associated treatment, including the history of various institutions, the practices of which some may find distressing. It also features some disturbing imagery. Viewer discretion is advised. Batman has apprehended the Joker and is returning him to where he belongs. The Elizabeth Arkham Asylum Psychiatric Hospital for the Criminally Insane along with the rest of his cronies. But it's a trap. The Joker escapes and Batman chases him through approximately 40 rooms, 34 corridors, 3 exterior areas and 3 hallucination sections in a game developed by Rocksteady Studios. A game that became the gold standard for licensed games for the next generation and would be the first step for one of the most highly acclaimed AAA action series of its era. IGN called Arkham Asylum the greatest comic book game of all time and assured every single one of us that it makes you <sighs> After Joker breaks loose, it becomes clear that he's been planning something big like this at the asylum for a while. Prisoners from Blackgate Penitentiary have been relocated to the asylum to help, with his confidant Harley Quinn overrunning the security systems, kidnapping the warden and allowing Joker control over the asylum. Batman gives chase throughout the intensive care building, eventually finding Joker who throws a horrifically mutated prisoner at him before he escapes and reveals that the police commissioner Gordon has also been kidnapped by a turncoat asylum guard no less. While following the turncoat by tracking traces of alcohol in his breath, Batman subdues Victor Zaz, an asylum patient, before escaping the building, overcoming obstacles Harley Quinn has left in his way. Now set free onto Arkham Island proper, Batman finds a fresh trail to track the commissioner and continues searching. The path leads him to the medical building. After using stealth and the shadows to subdue more prisoners who've taken several doctors hospitals, Batman rescues Penelope Young, the head of research at the asylum, who later leaves to retrieve her secret research notes before the Joker can get to them. Continuing to follow Gordon's trail leads Batman into the path of Scarecrow, who uses fear gas to drive his victims mad. Batman overcomes his afflictions and continues on his way. Eventually finding Gordon and Harley Quinn, Batman is shocked to find that Bane, a mercenary who uses venom toxin to infuse himself with superhuman strength, is being experimented on by Dr. Young to to try and find cures for asylum patients. Bane and Batman fight with Batman coming out on top. Revealing to his offsider Oracle that there's a Batcave on Arkham Island, Batman proceeds to look into Dr. Young's research, exposing a Titan formula, a stronger strain of the Venom serum which triggers transformations in the host. Oracle does some more digging and finds that Joker had been secretly funding Dr. Young's research, later beginning to threaten her when she said she wanted to stop. That's why he's here, to get the Titan formula and unleash monsters all over over Gotham. An alarmed Batman makes his way back to where Dr. Young had been heading to find her notes, the old Arkham Mansion. Batman encounters more foes, defeats Scarecrow once again, before finding and destroying Dr. Young's formula. However, the Joker has enlisted the help of Victor Zaz, whose torture forces Dr. Young to give up the formula and the location of a stockpile of Titan hidden in the Botanical Gardens. After being saved from Zaz, Dr. Young tries to give Batman the codes to get past the remaining security gates for the gardens, but is killed 
killed by a hidden explosive. Heading to the penitentiary to save the warden and obtain the access codes, Batman comes face to face with the asylum's core patients, fights his way through crowds of goons to corner and trap Harley Quinn, but only too late to stop her from setting Poison Ivy free from her cage. Now on his way to the gardens in the hidden research lab, Batman fights two Titan-infused prisoners and destroys the Titan production plant, but only after Joker has escaped with crates full of the serum. Batman seeks the help of Poison Ivy to find a plant which might be able to cure the effects of Titan and stop Joker's monsters if mass-produced. Poison Ivy tells Batman it's possible, but the only place to find the plant he needs is inside the lair of one Wayland Jones. Killer Croc. Batman ventures back into the sewer-like lair back in the intensive care facility, facing Scarecrow one last time before he's mauled and dragged into the undertow by Killer Croc himself. Batman retrieves the plants and heads back to the Batcave to begin making the cure. On his way, Poison Ivy and Joker have met up, and Joker has given her a dose of Titan, amplifying her abilities in a different way. Her plants begin to overtake the asylum, and while the Titan cure is being produced, the Bat computer is destroyed by Ivy. While making his way back to the surface with a a single dose of cure, Batman finds the Joker has been dumping Titan into the Asylum's water supply, which will begin to infect Gotham if it's allowed to enter the main pipe system of the city. Batman detours to stop that happening. Finally back on the island, the Ivy situation has gotten so out of hand that she's now the priority. Batman returns to the gardens to stop her rampage, and he does so. With every other avenue exhausted, and with enough Titan on hand to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bats, Joker invites Batman to his grand finale party for a showdown. When Batman defeats even more Titan foes, Joker reveals that Commissioner Gordon never got away and attempts to shoot him with Titan. Batman intercepts the shot and starts to change. Joker, maybe in a moment of clarity, or maybe just for a laugh, laments Batman ruining all his plans and shoots himself with the Titan as well. Batman uses the Titan cure on himself and yet, despite the physical disadvantage, bests the Joker, restores order, and brings an end to the madness. That's Arkham Asylum. We could look at each room in isolation and determine how good is this room? Is it really adding to the game? How good is the art in this room? How good is the design in this room? How good is the storytelling in this room? And this way we could evaluate every element of the game and push up the quality of all these different areas. And I think without making that foundational choice, making Arkham Asylum just wouldn't have been possible. It was one of the earliest decisions we made, but also one of the most important. So what I'd suggest you do is you create rules which allow you to focus your energy on what counts to you. Every game is made up of a number of features of varying quality. And during development, these features accelerate and improve at different rates. You have some real standout features. And these are the things you're really excited about. You've got a good feeling about these. You think these are going to really help to sell your game. And at the same time, the press are getting excited about these. But you also have weaknesses. These are maybe features that were more work than you thought they were going to be. You've looked at other games and you're behind the competition in these areas. They're not as good as everything else out there. And everyone on your team will have a pretty good idea of what those areas are in your game. So at that point, you have a decision. What's going to be your strategy on how you move forward? It's kind of natural to look at your weaknesses. You've invested a lot of time in these areas already. They're the lowest scoring area of your game. So it makes sense that that's where you'll put your effort. And they're also a very tangible problem, like you can really get your hands on that problem and think about how you can improve it. So the normal strategy at this point is to focus on your weaknesses, and when you spend your remaining time on that, this is kind of what happens. Your best features get a little bit better, your middle features again a bit better, and your weaknesses improve. And you've got a game which is a pretty, you know, average all-round game. You minimise the features that suck, definitely. So Rocksteady's strategy, where possible has always been to do the complete opposite of this and is actually focus all our energy on the strengths. You know, the strengths, the standout features of your game are going to be the things that get you noticed. They're going to be the things that provide the memorable moments for people. They're going to be the things that set your game apart. And we'll do that at the expense of the weaknesses. We will often just design those out. We'll basically look at those and go, look, that's just going to be too much effort to get good. Why don't we just not do that feature? And we'll be cutting those features, combining, improving, removing, to ensure that we're focusing all our effort on our strengths and not our weaknesses. The features that you don't do are just as important as the ones that you do. Even if you've started that feature, if finishing that feature is going to take away energy from your game, then not doing that feature is a really important thing, a really important and smart decision to make. And this is always tricky because all the time you're making your game, we have other games coming out, other competitive games coming out. And all these competitive games are one up in your game in different areas. And you have to decide what you're going to try and beat them in. But the one thing you can't do is be competitive in every area. It's impossible. No one has the time or the resources to do that. So you just have to make very smart decisions. 
So basically it appears as though Rocksteady believed in pushing their strongest features and the most marketable aspects of their game to be the best that they could be while leaving what was underwhelming the way that it was around 2009 to 2013. I can't say for now, but I think it's certainly an approach that makes sense for the right game, maybe specifically at that time, but feels rare to hear out loud. In 2022, maybe it, it even seems a little strange for a AAA studio director to admit that he wasn't trying to make a game that did everything. Is that like allowed to openly talk about how other contemporary titles do things better than yours? Impossible. He probably got yelled at. Asylum didn't quite predate the action-adventure genre's preoccupation with open worlds. Instead, it resisted it for a year or two, which afforded it a lot of focus, famously. But even still, the more all-around style is something that Rocksteady would approach later on, even if it becomes harder to determine which weaknesses may have been designed out of the later Arkham games. Focusing on the strengths, I think, remains an important aspect of Arkham for this studio for every game. And Sefton Hill outright saying that the Arkham series was content to not hit every button, to not sell to every customer, seems like the stance of a rebel when compared to the big hitters today, games which can try to be the only one you need for as long as possible by doing as many things as they can better than anybody else, with constant online updates to keep you playing the one game that you play. But Arkham both is and isn't this slightly quaint kind of AAA title because it's still using a massive IP to marry it to subversive horror stylings. To folks like me, the differences as well as that approachable exterior that Arkham had remains incredibly important, and it's a big part of why I think we still say that this game is great today. I was quite young at the time when Asylum was released. In 2009, I was just 13 years old, and from a fairly sheltered upbringing that kept violent games and violent films and stuff with adult ratings well out of my reach, Asylum was a way in to that for me. A way to find a more adult game that wasn't an impossible sell. It was a game that wasn't buried under a ton of gore or blood and guns, and a way to become more invested in games with a property that I knew and understood, which in its design could sample many different genres and centralize them all in one place. You've got action, you've got stealth, puzzles, and exploration gameplay all under one roof, and the style of each of those tenants was different from the competition, seemingly because Arkham chose the battles that it was going to fight, because Rocksteady insisted on making Arkham its own flavor, and knew the areas where they'd try to be iconic, whilst designating features they wouldn't even try to really compete with. You had melee, martial arts-based, third-person combat at a time where shooters or sword-based spectacle fighters with a norm. It's not the same as a spectacle fighter. It's not the same as a fighting game. It's not the same as a brawler or a hack and slash or a lock on sword play. It's a combination of all of those things that's also far more intuitive to play than any of them. Even to this day, and I'll argue all day about this, I think the only place you'll find combat that really feels like this remains the Arkham series, even despite many attempts at cloning it in the years since. You had reverse horror game Predator, reframing the stealth of Splinter Cell or Hitman, almost asymmetrically designed, flipping what was a style in which one normally plays as the underdog completely on its head. Stealth typically implied breaking into strongholds, being without power, not having combat tools if you were caught, and these were things that Batman subverted and turned around to make stealth confrontations feel very different than the usual approach, and also far less intimidating for new players to learn. You had a location and a world which straddled the style of Zelda dungeons and Metroid gadgetry within a more grounded, streamlined atmosphere that, while yes, boasted linearity, didn't actually lose out on all the opportunities that an open world presents. We have five dungeons here with an open world in between, right? The navigation of which we'll see expanded on in the later titles, but for all intents and purposes, the blueprint of Asylum's world of dungeons across an entire open space was kept for both city and night to a large extent, including a massive amount of focus on very, very few load screens. The continuous nature of the world and keeping everything uh, feeling interconnected was pretty ahead of its time at in 2009, I think it would be fair to say. The nature of dungeon presentation was far more subtle than Zelda in Arkham Asylum, far less on the nose about what it was, and by playing Asylum, because of choices like that, I could get a taste for what a lot of different games could do. Adult games that I would go on to play in a few years, or games from older systems that I didn't own. 
Arkham Asylum may have nakedly been a gateway into Batman, marketed as a standalone, comic-inspired story that would be a good first step for anyone unfamiliar with the character, but for me, and far more subtly, it was a gateway deeper into games by repurposing their history and the opportunities the medium had yet offered and sharpening them for the future. And we can talk all day about how so-called influential the Arkham series is. I expect any fan of the series is waiting for that spiel. But I think it's also a waste of my time to tell you even more shit you've heard 18,000 other videos talk about. And just because a lot of people said it doesn't mean it's necessarily the truth. Arkham, I think we can safely say at least, is a unique and well-chosen blend of elements of Zelda, Metroid, other spectacle fighters, which takes a unique approach to familiar ideas to suit Batman in particular. And the focus of Arkham Asylum and the studio's reticence to do more than it needed to do just for the sake of it remains a core thread throughout the series. Just because the game may have influenced titles afterward doesn't mean that it wasn't influenced itself. And I'd say its most resonant elements were in its approach to using asymmetrical power-based stealth, particularly in outdoor open environments on occasion, and its detective veneer's employment in the world design, and not its being the only comic superhero game to not be shit for once, because Lord knows the series did inspire some half-assed licensed adaptations. That's a spiel for another day, but for now, what exactly does focusing on strength over weakness mean in Arkham Asylum? Well, let's discuss some of the game's strengths and then we'll circle back to that idea. So we may as well start with the combat. Referred to as the free flow system, this is a largely rhythmic style of fighting, which as it's iterated on throughout the series, epitomizes many of the ideals of easy to learn, hard to master for video game design rules, I think. This is an intuitive system that incorporates a great deal more senses to excel at than one might expect, and I think it's a deeply enjoyable one. However, it's honestly kind of difficult to limit my comments to specifically Asylum's rendition of this system for today, because it was just improved on so substantially in the later entries that comparison and contrast becomes inevitable. In my opinion, the spirit of this system is improved to such an extent in later games, and the appeal become so much clearer that I kind of don't feel like this rendition really interests me as much at all. There are the basic essentials of free flow here, but the feeling that I enjoy from it is honestly kind of rare, and it's due to some significant factors. Eventually, the system becomes an extraordinarily meditative form of combat, like its namesake, promoting a flow-like state of play that I love falling into, especially with large groups of enemies, each with diverse tools. It involves timing as centrally as real-time strategy and reflexes, experimentation as much as prowess, and can be both very fun and very satisfying. Uniquely, I feel, free flow requires a high degree of spatial awareness from a player at nearly all times. While the amount of interaction that Batman might have with the environments around him during combat is quite minimal during free flow until Arkham Knight, it's easier to think about an entire room of hostiles being the enemy here, with many different tentacles achieving many different tasks than just you fighting several individual hostiles. You're fighting an entire room, not a crowd of people, right? You have to keep track of where everyone's standing, what they're doing and how you plan to go and reach them. It becomes subconscious, but just like how animating this combat involves a making a set of motions clear from potentially 360 degrees of vision, that the combat involves a sense of proprioception at all times is deeply enjoyable to me. It has to look right from every possible angle, and I have to be aware of every possible angle in a room while playing. More important than what the face buttons do, and largely undiscussed I feel, is how essential movement is to this system. It's easy to assume that the simplicity of the control scheme is what it's all about, as games like Sleeping Dogs or Shadow of Mordor would go on to assume. But more than anything, physics defines the free flow system. Unreal Engine 3 feels a very particular way, and the movement of Batman from foe to foe around the spaces really is the beat heart of this system that links everything else together. Batman bounces between points in the room, between hostiles, moving as if through water between multiple hostiles that he's engaging at one time. Especially
especially here in Asylum, where abilities which allow you to focus on and subdue single foes at a time are also minimal. For the room-based combat reason alone, I would consider Free Flow sufficiently different from any other superhero combat system I'd seen used until this point. It's not at all similar to Spider-Man 2 or even Marvel's Spider-Man later down the line. I don't know where people get that idea in the details. These are very different systems. At the Asylum stage, combat involves four basic controls in addition to a command of movement between foes. There's Strike, Counter, Stun and Evade, which makes up the bulk of the moves here. Strike is to punch, Counter is to stop someone from punching you and punch them instead. Stun is to sweep your cape across their face and leave them open to an attack and dazed for a minute. And Evade helps you dodge or leap over a foe to get at them from behind, get out of the way of a charging titan or a thrown object. There is the ability to incorporate multi-batterings into combos in Asylum following some upgrades, as well as the Bat Claw, but I'd say that one is fairly unintuitive and I don't tend to use it a lot. Gadgets during combat would be much more heavily emphasized and make the combat much more dynamic in the later titles. How essential the gadgets are to the fights isn't something that I tend to notice until it's taken away here, but without gadgets and more enemy types, there are only four in Asylum, a lot of this can feel quite bare upon returning, even despite the the effectiveness of the core system. Depth can be provided in what you choose not to do in the middle of a fight here, as well as what you choose to do, and in Asylum there are simply fewer things to evict from your decision making process, which makes combat easier and unfortunately much more shallow. The building of combos is still the name of the game, but dissimilar from some other titles, combo simply refers to how many moves you chain together in a row, not necessarily the learning of specific strikes which is its own set combo. Combos here are unlimited. The only thing that stops them is missing a hit or taking a hit. It's mostly about striking and countering at correct times and knowing where hostiles are on the field so you can navigate between them seamlessly. If you build your combo high enough after getting some upgrades, Batman can use some special moves here to throw an enemy or break his fucking leg put him out instantly, ouch. There's also a ground takedown, alternatively a crotch takedown, which are usually a stealth based move that can be implemented in combat if you time them right. You can kick a guy if you're on a line launcher, you can glide kick, but as of yet, the combat in Arkham Asylum is so bare essentials compared to the later entries, it's not only conceivable that you could incorporate every single one of Batman's moves into one combo, there's actually an achievement which you unlock by doing exactly that, and it's not terribly difficult to do. But it's not only the restrictive moveset, the lack of enemy types, and overall lack of dynamic in the fights which limits the system's appeal for me today above the core system, there's a few other major factors holding it back for me now. One of those reasons might seem obvious to a few of you, or like a bigger deal to some of you than others, especially those who've been playing the game for quite some time, and it's the simple fact that if there's one thing that Rocksteady never quite learned how to do, it's how to teach people to use the free flow system properly. In general, Rocksteady maintain a stubborn approach to keeping tutorials and buttons on the screen way past the time they're needed for every Arkham game as if The Last Guardian had the right idea. So just so you don't forget, remember, the bomb's payload is exposed and you can use the power winch to trigger a controlled explosion. And Batman will keep telling you that no matter how many times you've done it before. Maybe it's two different points to say that Rocksteady A are not great at tutorials and B just never stop telling me how to press X and square to throw someone even if I've been playing this game for 12 years, but in either case it's just a problem with conveyance. Tell me something. You've never let me catch you this easily. What are you really after? I know it's common to comment on the intro hallway to Asylum and say it's not actually boring because it's effective exposition, which it definitely is. This is introducing characters, locations, story, atmosphere, stakes immediately in deft fashion, but really, because of that, Asylum's introduction is breakneck and kind of always was. There's nothing lethargic about this, and especially compared to contemporary titles, you get to the action of Asylum almost right away. If you started them both at the same time, you'd be fighting an asylum sooner than GTA 5 would have you loaded into the world. But along with that breakneck introduction comes inadequate time to show a new player 
what the combat is optimally supposed to look like. While it might be a fault in the combat's design that you don't need to be especially good at it or even know how to play it correctly to finish the game by not punishing mistakes, it's not helped but by the idea that there isn't much time spent explaining what the free flow combat even is when you're doing it right before you get into it. I certainly had to find that out for myself after I'd already beaten Asylum five or six times. I've seen this confusion often for years. It can be really difficult for someone maybe to even figure out why they'd bother learning it that way. You're not only able to beat this game by button mashing or camping on the counter button by essentially never learning it at all. Mashing is unfortunately probably the way that most players play to this game. What's the point in improving your skills at using a system the game never really needs? Why go past the skill ceiling the game could effectively challenge? I mean, it's pretty easy to know how a shooter is supposed to be optimally played and FPS titles can use the environments to encourage or incentivize to certain types of approach to different skirmishes. But for a rhythmic system, which involves a keen observation of entire room of enemies, it might have been helpful for the presentation of Batman in the game to highlight more effectively how this combat is supposed to look, especially in cutscenes early on, and in making him feel or look overall more physically consistent within the entire game. What I mean by that is I, I can forget that there's a severe disconnect between this hulking brute of a man and this balletic figure skater during combat just because I've played these games for so long. But for new players, that division is definitely an issue. There's a reason why someone would assume that the aim of the combat is to mash the button to punch the one guy as many times as possible, and it's because everything else about battle Batman is slow and deliberate and implies force much more centrally than grace. For, for an alternative example, you know how in the Maguire Spider-Man movies, there's like a massive difference in how Peter Parker moves and walks around from the way that Spider-Man does. Like in the middle of scenes, Maguire's Parker doesn't seem particularly athletic or move in the same way that he does when he's got the mask on. But uh, I mean, that's a performance choice, but with Tom Holland, because of the way he moves, no matter what he's wearing, it always feels like you're looking at the same person. His plainclothes physicality matches his costumed one. I mean, I love the Raimi movies, it's my fucking childhood, but Holland's performance is more physically cohesive. And it's the division in Maguire's that subtly here in the difference between a tree trunk and this pirouetting waterbender. And we can't blame new players for not connecting those dots or anyone who thinks that this is kind of silly. It stands to reason that this combat might feel like it belongs more within a moveset which is consistently flowing and fast given that Batman is jumping from foe to foe so quickly. This is so different from how he moves in the rest of the game. If I can get technical, it feels important because the combat is a system that somehow involves input buffering as the core technique, asking you to hit a button just as your previous strike is ending to essentially cue the next action and you're committed to that move once you put it in the queue. However, understanding this or coming to that conclusion or feeling that visually is difficult because the animation of Batman during any other game type doesn't include anticipation frames for his actions. And subconsciously, there's no reason to assume that would change when he starts hitting people. Anticipation frames actually allow for the timing windows for the input buffering in how this combat controls. And those two, those two concepts are intertwined and neither of them are required to understand for the proper function of any other aspect of Batman's moveset. To demonstrate maybe, when Batman is just walking around, if you double tap X to evade, he immediately does it. He doesn't wind up and crouch down and then start his jump because the action has already been input and he can't anticipate something that hasn't happened yet. When you grapple to a higher ledge, he may pull back slightly to propel himself forward, but he doesn't pull his grapnel gun from his belt, turn around and fire. He jolts in the direction he needs to, and the wire is already out of the canister as soon as you press the button. There is no anticipation phase for that action. That lack of anticipation frames carries into the first two hits of a fresh combo. He just hits, the hit happens instantly before something kinetic changes in the way that Batman is moving and he starts adding in the wind up frames to his next attack so you can anticipate when that hit will land. Moving from one throw to another in the way that free flow is optimally played shows Batman spending time in the air before his hits land because while the strike has already been input, the action isn't finished yet. There's time between the input and the result. 
that isn't there in any other game type. The travel time between two enemies becomes the anticipation phase for the next strike, a window that you can then use to time the next input. This is to create the timing windows that wouldn't be there otherwise and is why movement is the most important part of this system. The way the system is supposed to be played utilizes the movement of the current hit to telegraph when you input the next one, and that time becomes the anticipation phase for the next move. There's a delay between the input and the result that no other moves in the game asks you to be aware of. I hope this is coming across, but that's the idea of it. There are delays to actions in the midst of a combo that doesn't exist anywhere else, and it's a change of control style which might not be obvious to a new player. I'm not an animator, so I'm sure there, there are more effective ways to scrutinize or speak about the combat of this game, but I do think it's worth speaking about how the system is fun as hell, but is never effectively taught in the games, and maybe some reasons why it might be hard for new players to understand what it's supposed to look like. It certainly took me a long time to figure out. I love this system, I pretty much, it's, I think it's it's beautiful. I, I'm more fond of it than maybe any other combat, a yeah, third person combat system personally, but really it doesn't feel like it should make a lot of sense sometimes. And there's absolutely good reasons why people constantly think this is a button mashing system. I still have to sit next to people who've never played the game and walk them through how it looks when you're doing it right by holding up the controller and making them pay attention to when I'm hitting the buttons, where I'm pushing the stick, all that jazz. Rocksteady designed a really amazing system, the basis of a system here, and they implemented it beautifully. I just don't think they knew how to help all players make the most of it, and I'm not sure if that ever changes. We'll see the general feel of Batman's moveset polished up in Arkham City to a ridiculous degree, and he's given a big speed boost to nearly everything he does in Arkham Knight on top of a major physics change feel change seen in Unreal Engine 4 for that title, so this division between the combo Batman and any other Batman definitely feels the most stark to me in Asylum, and I think it's a big part of why this gameplay can feel more underwhelming to me now than it used to. It's all in those details, and those different game types can sometimes feel like they're segmented from the combat very distinctly. The next thing that drags down on the combat for me is the overuse of slow motion. I understand and quite like the close-ups and slow motion emphasizing the last hit of a fight. That's a really clever and effective presentation choice to tie a bow on the end of an encounter, but slow motion is used really often in the middle of fights and it starts making them feel worse. In general, I think slow motion is more effective when following a hit after the explosion or to show a near miss, something that's worth looking at basically. But in Asylum, random speed ramping happens so often just on ordinary strikes that it lessens the impact of your hits, it messes up your rhythm and makes things feel more fake, a lot less meaty. The slow motion is getting in the way of what's an engaging system with a lot of hit feedback. And I estimate that everything would feel far more responsive if it wasn't slowing down all the time. Actually, I, I don't estimate, I know, because no other Arkham game does this. And the last thing weighing down this combat for me now is just the brevity of each encounter. The fights are short and as a result they don't convey much, however, I choose to interpret this in a positive way, because it means that in heavy contrast to other licensed games like Marvel Spider-Man in particular, Arkham rarely if ever employs hostile reinforcements when designing fight rooms. One of my pet peeves. When you walk into a room and you see six enemies in a room, once they're down, the fight is done. I really, really appreciate that to just having a door in a room that opens when you're nearly finished the fight and sending another 20 dudes through it. It's a really cheap technique that a lot of these sorts of games can use to pad out fights and it robs the sense of triumph to replace it with relief when everything is finally done. I thought I beat this 10 minutes ago. It's one of the most significant differences between Arkham and Spider-Man to me. Arkham really drags on its combat despite the obvious temptation to do that. And I do like how Rocksteady didn't go for that easy route out and just throw more and more enemies at Batman to pad out the fights, so ultimately the brevity of the fights here I prefer to the alternative. However, one of the sections that kind of does do this, the one involving a titan foe and three elevators here, remains one of the most challenging raw Arkham combat encounters that I think Rocksteady ever designed. It may have required from my end the further handicap of not buying armor upgrades and playing on the highest difficulty, which removes counter indicators in this game, but the well-balanced challenge of this particular fight is usually something I can only find in ridiculous challenge maps in the later games. 
but I surmise that part of the reason that the Arkham games never made their campaigns particularly difficult once you figure out how to play might be because Rocksteady actually couldn't create ways to teach a player to use any higher level strategies, and so couldn't design more difficult encounters for them. The skill ceiling is relatively low here. Still, for games not seeking to be crushing, there's usually a really nice balance of difficulty with power in the Arkham series overall for an entertainment property. And Arkham is a series looking to convey power more than opposition, I feel, with the more tense or challenging sections tending to be stealth, especially the Cobra Tanks and Cloud Bursts in Arkham Knight. I know a lot of people, including myself, really love playing these games again and again and again. And while I haven't played Arkham Asylum in over four years, there's still a deep muscle memory built into every scuffle here. I can play pretty much this whole game while barely paying attention even to this day. Even if it was challenging once upon a time, the lack of randomization in encounters and how predictable AI behavior becomes can mean that both Asylum and City are both easy for me to plow through without even really thinking, even when on highest difficulties. That this encounter, one of the very last in their campaign, feels like it's at a satisfying level only when I don't buy armor. It means that I have to really look for Arkham to challenge me in the campaigns. So I really enjoy when it does that, but it's something that I miss when it's not there. But tying into that, tying into the, the whole room being the enemy here, is how I come to see this combat as being more about ownership of the room than defeating people here. In general, I think this is a fun system to play, but Batman's characterization within it is all business, and I think that really says a lot. This implies a a formality to the proceedings here, a sense of power about the place that's being fought in rather than any joy that Batman might gain, since he doesn't necessarily react to the presence of hostiles, he just deals with it. Observing what those kinds of subtle character choices convey is a huge part of this system and this universe, in combination with Asylum's strong atmosphere and its environment focus overall, establishing control over the Asylum is a consistent theme. And I think it plays into the combat feeling like ownership very well, or reclamation very well. And it's complemented by the approach to the stealth here too. This is Batman's house. This is my house. You come at me with 18 guys, I'll walk away without breaking a sweat sort of vibe. It's very cool, and the game knows that it's cool, but gives no indication that Batman ever basks in that. He's just about getting the job done. And that feeling is what the combat is evoking, I think. All business, get out of my way. I'm gonna destroy you, don't even try me, sort of thing. It's very Batman, I guess. Talking about stealth, you wanna have a big sneak. We're doing it now, we're talking about stealth, if you wanna hang some people. Alright, so the stealth of Arkham is another one of its strengths, but it's so strong and such a complete package so quickly that it became a game type that I think would prove to be one of the most difficult areas for Rocksteady or Wanda Montreal to iterate on. It's another great game type that's implemented beautifully into the formula of Arkham. It's paced so well, every single stealth encounter arrives at the perfect time in this game. And again, it stands pretty much a head and shoulders above the stealth of most any other licensed properties even to today but as i see it the way that this was designed for arkham asylum actually kind of painted rocksteady and warner into a bit of a corner for an extended period of time unwilling to change the basic tenets that they set up for it in later games while we'll see some of it changed in city and origins improving move sets and tools tighter environments and more interesting places to sneak around in different kinds of foes who affect batman while in those spaces it's not actually until night sort of restructures and rethink a lot of stuff that Asylum is actually meaningfully iterated on in the Predator mechanics in my opinion. So Asylum is still quite strong in the series relative to City and Origins in the stealth department because of the game's atmospherics getting to take the center stage. And while it feels more quaint and a little less free in some ways, with the ways to take down enemies becoming barely over a handful, the actual feeling of Predator I think is the most pronounced that it ever gets in Asylum. And it feels like it has an energy here that unfortunately slips away kind of quickly. The most obvious reliance of the system is on the vantage Point, something I'll be talking about a fair bit. There's safe places for Batman to perch above enemies and assess the field. And at a glance and an application, this is very cool. It gives a feeling of domination to the stealth and helps convey the 
reverse horror game vibe that it's going for, tilting the balance of power in an interesting direction for this genre. Enemies have firearms, but you can hide and surprise them, so it feels more like an even fight. Because of Batman's combat abilities as well, being seen isn't necessarily a game over and is more just an element of the encounter, allowing you to run away or charge head on if you know what you're doing. Now this might in some cases lead to stealth that feels a little imbalanced, as if Batman is overpowered, which is definitely true in some cases. However, I think he stays pretty squishy in this game type. You're gonna die if you sort of I mean, I haven't played on easy mode for a while, but at least I still felt kind of vulnerable when I was seen. And at least in Asylum, you're usually trapped inside rooms, which limits your means of escape from these encounters. You're stuck here. You're definitely going to get caught in some sticky situations if you're not careful, even despite how many tools you might have on hand. Now, this imbalance, however, is an area that we'll see at least both Spider-Man and the uh, Middle Earth series, the Mordor series, struggle with, indicating that it's not just Batman that has trouble with this. I think Spider-Man's web can be even more overpowered than Batman stuff here and stealth encounters feel very much the same sort of just killing time until it gets to the combat which is a much more central affair in Spider-Man and the Mary Jane sections of stealth are a fantastic uh, character and narrative idea but they're not nearly as interesting as they could be and with the Middle Earth series I could probably just make a whole video about this but I don't ever think there's been a game so imbalanced that that actually becomes the main idea with individual upgrades to your abilities pretty much single-handedly breaking and reframing how stealth or combat is approached overall as soon as you obtain them. Things like the shadow shot to move to where your arrow is shot completely breaks stealth in this game. The Middle Earth games are a full-on mess and I think it makes Arkham feel perfectly tuned. So even if there is a little bit of imbalance in Arkham, I'm, I'm pretty, I think I can assume that it could be a lot worse because I've seen a lot worse. But something I think helps the stealth in Asylum uh, is the differences in the shapes of rooms in which these encounters actually happen. The medical center is one of the very first stealth encounters, so it presents a fairly rectangular room that doesn't have a clear focus point. There are easy to access walkways, there's a few exploding walls, and some gargoyles as well, and it's pretty easy to separate hostiles from each other. Your chances to get spotted here are relatively low if you pay even a small amount of attention. But the Arkham Mansion Predator encounter, probably my favorite of the game, takes place in a long library with a bit of a crossroads in the middle, so it, it feels more about isolating a hostile in one of the four wings of the room while everyone else is away from there. You can actually try and control the movement of the group so you don't get cornered yourself. There are also these uh, filing cabinets parallel to the walkways, which makes the galleys a little harder to access, but allows for more ledge takedowns and back claw pulls, takedown types which are more rare in other rooms. The predator encounter in the pump station I think is probably the weakest in the game, maybe the most unclear in terms of shape. There's a few large exploding walls and some confused vent placement that really doesn't create a great flow to the room and leaves the encounter or approach to it feeling cramped and unclear, like there's more space to hide in than there is in the room itself. And for this reason, I actually kind of like to think of stealth rooms in Arkham as being uh, designed in some way similar to skate parks in a sense. You can build a skate park in a lot of different ways. You can build it to facilitate a certain kind of approach for any person with a a skateboard or a set of rollerblades or whatever. With isolated half pipes and bowls to encourage transitions or vert tricks, which is a valuable type of obstacle to have, you'll seal off a section of your park to just be for one very particular kind of skating. And Batman Arkham stealth rooms can be the same. If you include a weak wall, you have to think about how a player might get there, how it's hidden from other uh, areas in the room, how hostiles might walk past it. It takes more than just thinking about the wall, you have to think about how it would be used in the larger context of the room. So it sort of seals off that part of it to just be for that one technique. Occasionally that's valuable and like in the medical center, having places where you can separate hostiles from each other is great. But there's also other skate parks that focus on flow and there are other opportunities in stealth rooms that are more open, allow you to continuously move around the room and do simple takedowns in quick succession. So I think there, there are multiple ways to create dynamic within stealth encounters by ensuring that every stealth encounter feels different from the last and a lot of that is architecture and not necessarily just down to the way that Batman controls. And I think it's worth imbuing a stealth room with a bit of risk. I might want this to be easy, 
but I kind of don't. However, while the vantage point aspect of the stealth might feel really cool and it looks really cool, to me it always felt like it disincentivizes any kind of risky experimentation in Predator here and caused Rocksteady to ignore a lot of ground gameplay tools for a long time. There simply aren't more foolproof strategies than waiting for someone to wander underneath a gargoyle and leap down or invert a takedown them, since at least in Asylum, there's almost nothing that hostiles can do to stop that happening. We'll see Rocksteady acknowledge how overpowered these are by mining the gargoyles later, however in that room it's completely ineffectual since there's still a perfectly viable building to stand on top of in the middle of the room. But it happens in later games too. Rocksteady struggled to walk back on this idea or give hostiles tools to meaningfully fight back against a high ground camping Batman, and it's an area that Warner Montreal had similar trouble playing down. The answer was to improve, I think, the ground floor gameplay and make it more enjoyable and more viable than sticking up high, something we won't really see fully happen for the series only getting some of the way there in the way that night changes things, but I'll speak more about that on some other day. For now, there's corner cover and some ledge stuff and basic crouching ability, and while vantage points are an interesting aspect of this, I don't think it makes up for not including more ground gameplay tools like from other stealth games like Splinter Cell or utilizing light and shadow like in Thief. The latter in particular makes a lot of sense to me for Batman. Thief is a pioneering series for stealth games. It's pretty funky, but it goes so far into hardcore core areas of Sneak that I think it's surprising more of its ideals still haven't seen wider use within AAA like hybrid games of today. I'm not sure Thief's emphasis on sound design would maybe necessarily fit in Arkham, as much as I wish throwing batarangs did distract guards, but the idea of paying attention to how illuminated your player character is within a sneak environment is a perfect fit for Batman. The insinuation is that he's already blending into his environment, using the shadows and looking like a part of the architecture so that hostiles don't see him, but that's just implied instead of making it a mechanic. And if I'm actually asked to consider how hidden I am in shadow, things become much more real and adds a lot more dynamic to every other system here, and the environment as well. This vantage point is safe because it's in shadow, but I can't do anything from here, while this bright one gives me great opportunities, but I might get seen. Stuff like that. Standing behind a, a statue or a corner that's particularly dark helps me become part of that wall to basically leap out and attack from plain sight. There's a lot this particular system may have added to a Batman game, and it indicates a lot to me about how the stealth kind of failed to grow over the years. By not putting more flesh on the bone, vantage points are just automatically the most viable strategy all of the time and is what this system ends up becoming defined by, especially in Asylum where gadgets are much less of a focus. While this does have advantages to keeping room construction interesting and vertical all series long, we can see it backfire, like in Arkham City's Wonder Tower, in which gargoyles are placed on the exterior of the tower environment and leads to a bloated and boring stealth encounter in the middle of a moment of high narrative tension where speed is necessary. Since no prior stealth environment in City or in Asylum has taught a player how to engage in Predator without relying on vantage points for strategies. The Botanical Gardens room in Asylum has a lot of those same problems. One of the very few circular rooms in the whole game, it has a lot of ledges and vertical opportunities, but by using any of the umpteen vantage points, you're more likely to attack people on the top floor, which will then draw any other hostile up there to check, and it eliminates much of the lower floor engagement. Really, this whole room is just all these vantage points focused on one crescent-shaped platform that's easiest for you to access. Basically, unless it feels like like you genuinely might get spotted, a whole lot of what makes stealth gameplay interesting is being put to the side. There's no reason to not abuse the presence of safe hiding places in stealth. There has to be a catch along with it. If you close your doors in FNAF, you're going to chew through your power. If you hide in a wardrobe in any other horror game, you can barely see if it's safe to move out, but you can't progress until you risk it. Asylum asks nothing of you to use the vantage points. There is no catch, and they present so many advantages with so few limitations. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Aesthetically, it rocks and it leads to some great moments and environmentally it fits so, so well, but eventually the Predator system seemed to believe that vantage points was what made the system great, needed to construct stealth rooms to always have them, instead of fleshing out more of the whole reverse horror game side of things with more tools and imagination. Again, it impacts more of the stealth of Arkham overall 
than Asylum itself necessarily, and while the Predator is a bit of a less engaging aspect of the game to me than combat, I do think the atmosphere and the energy of Predator is really strong in Asylum, largely thanks to the novelty not really being worn off by this point. I would still say I enjoy the stealth here despite how predictable it becomes, mostly because of the idea of it. If this wasn't Batman in the game type however, I don't know if it would work as well. What I said about muscle memory definitely applies most strongly to Predator rooms in Asylum of Anywhere, with very specific routes to blow up walls or attack lone prisoners, string up using inverted takedowns, or throwing sonic shock batterings becoming an elementary affair just given how well I know these rooms. I can tackle these rooms in exactly the same way every time, that's how speedrunners do this. How well I know the enemy setups in the rooms when I first approach them, how easy to predict the AI becomes, it just, it's a fun game type for a long time, but once you figure it out, it's the same every time you play the game. To mess around with the hostiles to try and scare them before taking them down just isn't fun for me anymore, that was sated a long time ago, and I stopped feeling the tension in these rooms because I know them like the back of my hand. I think it's fun and I enjoy the feeling of it, but it's no longer tense, and I'm not certain that I'm able to meaningfully comment on whether that's the game's fault, or simply the sheer amount of familiarity I've gained with it over 12 years. I do think more randomization, more dynamic difficulty in Asylum would have fit really well, especially for Predator, and I just don't necessarily find the whole wacky takedowns to be an interesting side of the game to me. If Batman is behaving like it's all business, that's the way I felt myself to inhabit him. I'm just about getting this done quickly and quietly. But hopefully, Asylum and Arkham nails down something else important about stealth really quickly that carries forward for nearly every game. Quest objectives like hostages and such are often placed inside stealth rooms so that it makes sense for the encounter and for Batman to take everybody down. Sometimes you can just dip an encounter early, but there's usually an immediate goal to focus on which justifies him hanging out in this area and not just moving on. It helps the encounter feel like it belongs in those spaces. It makes stealth feel more important than combat in some ways since by their nature they need to be more supported narratively and the payoff for completing them feels more substantial as a result. So even if stealth isn't particularly tense to me anymore, from a narrative design standpoint having a story goal placed inside a dangerous room at the end of a trail is really rewarding structure and it adds a level of dynamic to the Arkham experience that I don't want to leave unappreciated. It's a game type that asks me to slow down, that's implemented at exactly the right times, whenever a stealth encounter comes up I'm always happy to do it. Placed next to combat in such a complimentary way, it fits aesthetically inside Asylum like a hand in a glove, and I really enjoy it, but I, I do think there's more that could have been done to keep this, uh, keep the longevity of stealth in mind, is what I, I think I'm getting at. I've hacked into her email accounts. Two mail stand out. The first is a resignation letter dated last week. Sounds like she was trying to get away. And the second? A message from Joker. Well, Jack White. It's a long thread. Uh, she's begging to stop the experiment, says it's too dangerous. He's not listening. Let's see. Random threats to her family, a couple of bad jokes, a picture of a dead baby and a threat. Go on. He says, I'm coming for you, I want what I paid for, and then another joke about wheelchairs, lovely. And a drawing of some kind of donkey. No mystery why she's so scared. I'm coming up to the surface, I'll find her. The third strength that I think Rocksteady decided was really a priority for their Batman game has a lot to do with the appeal as well as the construction, but includes maybe the most influential and controversial aspect of the series design. To make a game about the world's greatest detective, Rocksteady decided to include sleuthing mechanics, following blood and chemical trails, analyzing fingerprints, scientific calculations using some tech, background info, various collectibles associated with that woven into the non-diegetic elements, and nearly all of that is centralized within the detective vision mode. A sight alteration which, alongside Assassin's Creed's Eagle Vision, changed the way that third-person action games structure their collectibles, design their levels, and utilize visual conveyance at almost a core 
all levels. We may love the combat and the world building in the style, but the most influential part of Arkham is probably the function and style of detective vision in good and bad ways. And how it became such a shortcut for level design and accessibility is an extremely noteworthy part of Arkham's legacy. So many AAA titles for the past 10 years offer some way for a player to focus their senses, turn something on to see through walls, highlight certain objects, get info about an enemy, or move through a space using some kind of special sight and both Arkham and Assassin's Creed really led that charge. On the surface, because there's no cost to Detective Vision, the most common complaint is that it's easy to just leave on all the time and miss out on the handcrafted visuals of this beautiful looking game. It's probably safe to assume that discussion would have been held at Rocksteady at some point about how powerful an ability this is and how it was chosen to be rendered. To see people through walls, to know what state of alertness they're in, to have a secret weapon on you basically at all times, but even while calls that it was overpowered with there immediately and have almost never left discussion, Rocksteady really stuck to their guns. Many, many games have taken swings at similar effects, sometimes limiting movement while it's active, not having as extreme a visual change, uh, sometimes limiting how long you can use it, or altering the effect to only highlight certain types of items and not enemies, but Batman's detective vision remained this way for basically every game. Very few restrictions, with the main drawback of using it being how it impacts the game's visuals, something that the player was meant to keep an eye on. In later games we'll see certain stealth enemies who can jam your detective mode systems, some who are invisible to it, which leads credence to the idea Rocksteady knew that this, much like vantage points, was potentially a problem and decided to fix it by adding more things to make it seem more necessary instead of taking things away. But if there's a solution apart from just changing the visual style of it altogether, if they even thought it was a problem that people were using Detective Vision too much, I personally think it was staring Rocksteady in the face, in the sound effects. Sound ideas baked into environments so that Detective Vision actually ends up simulating some kind of sensory overload might have been a sneaky way to encourage a player to turn it off as much as possible. It's an outside the box idea, but players already get annoyed at the visuals of it, so you can lean into that. If it's overpowered, lean in further and make it sound too much, make it sound like garbage, make it sound so annoying that the use of it becomes the cost of using it. But even with these issues of taste per player, there's an important thing that the detective adjacent mechanics give to the game overall, no matter what they look like. And that's a constantly analytical tint to the way that Batman perceives the world in the Arkham series. As a mechanic, it may have its drawbacks, but in what it conveys about the character, Detective Vision is indispensable. The more and more filters the game asks me to look through, the more and more I begin to see the world around me in the way that the game wants me to. While the tracking of tobacco trails and fingerprint marks is a bit on the nose with respect to level design and fairly meaningless to me now as someone who knows where all these start and end, the thought of it is what counts that the fun, accessible novelty way is here to do some small detective work augmented by technology. It's an entertaining way to package something that could get very crunchy and take a lot of focus. The most intensive it gets here is a cryptographic sequencer, a gadget we'll see many times in the series. However, this rendition of it is actually personally my favorite because of the simplicity of the device and the sound wave flavoring just feeling more responsive, hacky, and retro. But detective games that go really hardcore with puzzles can be hit or miss for me, and contextual sleuth systems within a game that keeps an eye on multiple kinds of action and wants to keep things moving as quickly as Asylum does means that the weeds of actual crime scene work, at least for now, is understandably backseat. It's more the veneer that helps give someone an understanding of how Batman approaches a problem that counts, something that his writing in the story reinforces as well. It may be a little emotionless and a little bit clinical, but perhaps that should be seen as more of an element, a choice, than an altogether accidental thing. Detective Vision helps demonstrate to me as a player how Batman sees the world, how he goes about doing what he does, and softly lets me in on that process. Portraying Batman as a detective first and foremost, whether it's by giving him powerful mechanics and methods, or by the way he moves through the world and speaks about his mission, is for sure something that Rocksteady committed to, and something that plays a central role in the overall feel of the Arkham Batman from here on out. In contrast to how little he speaks, 
talks about fighting or predator. He's nearly always talking about following trails and tracking, his suspicions on people's motives, what his next move needs to be. What he says reinforces who he believes himself to be, and he's squarely in the box of, I'm a detective approaching a problem. The way the character approaches the problems isn't really something that changes at all for the Arkham games. It's a little different for Origins, which makes sense because he's younger, and it evolves in Night, but by this point, Batman's absolute focus on the task at hand is really important character information. At least I've got no choice but to see it that way. He might get faster, his moves might get bolstered, he might get more gadgets, fly to higher heights, but there are aspects of his detective style and approach that do not move from where they're put in Asylum from narrative and style standpoints. It cuts through the world around it and allows Batman's own focus to feel like a role to step into that's supported by the dominance of detective vision and detective adjacent mechanics as a viewpoint for the player. And what that portrayal adds to the appeal of Arkham Asylum is really important. The game includes the voices of Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill and Arlene Sorkin and the presence of Paul Dini as a writer, all personnel who were carried over from the Batman animated series. There's also a general comic flair in Arkham Asylum that brought it a degree of originality as well as a feeling of legitimacy that even if the detective vision is a little passe, that portrayal along with the familiarity lets someone know that Rocksteady understand who the character is and want it to be a genuine reflection of his wider world by connecting it in concept to previously popular instances of Batman media. While internal development began on concept levels about Arkham City around six months before Asylum was released, at the time it's doubtful whether Rocksteady could see what would become the Arkham version of Batman particularly clearly. It feels like it takes Batman seriously, sort of because it's not fully its own thing, and it builds off the work from previous Batman teams. But as a result, Asylum and Arkham overall quickly became what's referred to as an accepted interpretation. You might have seen the films and you may have read some comics, but if the whole of your experience with this character belongs to this series of games, that's not altogether discussed to be a bad thing because you'll have seen and experienced stories which took the character seriously, presented him in a way that is detailed and passionate, and communicates the energy of Batman honestly. You don't need to have any further knowledge than Arkham to be able to call yourself a fan of this property. It might seem petty, but Arkham being an accepted interpretation basically means it was embraced by the Batman community, given faith by DC Comics from then on. It's its own version of the Batman story, seen in its own full way as being something completely separate, even despite the contradiction of being tied to the animated series. Aspects of it were committed to, and this game has enjoyed its own place of establishing its own separate Batman canon that operates pretty much by itself. Carrying over the voice cast from Batman the Animated Series gives Arkham versions of Batman, Joker, and Harley Quinn, portrayed by the three best performers to ever inhabit those roles. I think Tara Strong's fantastic as Harley, but Arlene Sorkin just has a special place in my heart. And it gives you Paul Dini, a writer who has experience with these characters and can make sure that they're saying the right things, saying things that feels true to those characters. However, it's worth noting a couple of things for him though. Now, Paul Dini had worked principally on cartoons and television, as well as comics. And while a good writer is a good writer, writing for video games is an extremely different field of work than any other kind of media. It's a very fluid state to be. You're writing the game to connect objectives, building set pieces that have already been designed. You write it while the rest of the game is being completed. You can't do too much writing. You have to move stuff along, particularly in 2009. It's a really different feel of writing. Additionally, while Dini is credited as the writer, the lead narrative designer, a role which is probably more important when it comes to structure and deciding what to and what not to include, is filled for Asylum and City alongside Dini by Paul Crocker. So basically, while I can look at who's in the credits, because of the difference between writing for games and writing for shows, that Dini hasn't continued writing for games past the first two Arkham titles, and to be blunt, that I don't think either of these games has particularly strong stories, I take his name being in the credits with a bit of a different understanding. I don't think it's entirely conjecture to assume that Rocksteady, at the time a young British studio with only one prior release, might have needed a bit of help with this property. They pitched their idea for a Batman game and a Batman premise, but might not have been entirely confident with these legacy characters, 
and DC may have paired them with Dini to help with specifically that, to lend legitimacy, to oversee the characters, and to help Rocksteady create a version of a Batman story that has the right energy to it, because its characters are guided by experienced hands. You don't need to teach someone how to walk with them. Ultimately, creating the right feeling for the world in the Batman mythos turned out to be really important and meaningful to the audiences who played these games, something we can probably thank Dini and DC for keeping control of to a large extent, until Rocksteady felt more comfortable investing in their own styles and doing their own takes on these characters later down the line. Asylum isn't doing things like changing the Penguin significantly, or altering the Red Hood story, or creating a version of Joker that is entirely hallucinatory. These are very safe portrayals of these characters, which stuck very closely to what the animated series or what comics readers were familiar with, with a darker take on them. With the most risky choice, which was actually talked about a bunch in interviews pre-release for the game, the most risky choice here was apparently giving Harley Quinn a different outfit. Of course, that's all with the benefit of hindsight, able to see that this did all pay off. While I'd seen Batman Begins and The Dark Knight by the time I played Asylum, I see this as the game which basically really sold me on Batman in the first place, and my experience of Batman prior to its release is very minimal, so I can't really say how risky this might have been personally. And I think it arrived at a time where a more comic accurate depiction of Joker's style or Batman's physique was apparently deliberately quite different to what Nolan and Joker Baby was doing at the time, so maybe in 2009 this was a little risky. Regardless, even while aesthetically these characters feel very safe today, especially since now we know how eagerly audiences respond to comic accurate visuals of these characters like Batfleck, what's more sure is that any character in Asylum who isn't Joker or Harley can have some really, really super awkward and underwritten interactions, and I don't need to do a lot of work to prove that. If this is comic accurate, I think anyone who's not predisposed to Batman, who isn't convinced, would look at a scene like this and laugh out loud and think it's hilarious. Even I think it's pretty underwhelming. Uh, say, he looks all run down. Let's pep him up. No! Uh, Batman! I'm going to deal with the story more later on, but for now, I think it's interesting to note that the story was in experienced hands and not really straying too far from the path, which gave Rocksteady the means to focus on the world more centrally, and make sure that the place in which this story was being told felt like somewhere to step into. A lot of this comes down to how the island and the asylum itself feels like a place to belong, and without that feeling like a full place, there's a lot less of a chance that Arkham would have been embraced raced as an accepted interpretation, especially given how seriously it takes itself tonally. So let's take a cursory glance at what this control on story afforded Rocksteady in the world. The Victorian-inspired style for the medical facility in Arkham is the first step in cementing how real this asylum feels. The Victorian era is the basis for such terrific stories and feelings as the original Sherlock Holmes, one of Batman's primary points of inspiration. It re-emphasizes the specter of Alcatraz hanging over the entire premise of the game, and reminds me of the television show The Nick, one of the best and most accurate modern depictions of medicine and surgery at that time. This shit was grisly, it conjures the weight of history, and it's a haunting choice to build out a hospital in its vein. And yet the weight and tone of that carries the energy of Batman directly into your home. Examining any of the instruments or the paraphernalia around the medical facility reinforces the, that grisly idea. However, you know, sometimes finding a head in a jar or a wall just chock full of skellies can push asylum into pantomime territory on occasion. I mean, it's certainly one way to convey that people have died here, but it's age is what I'm saying. Go to the graveyard next to the botanical gardens and look at the completely disproportionate 2D skeleton sprites, or just think about how Batman is asked to fight skeletons during the scarecrow sequences. Like, stop for a second. What is... What is with all the skeletons? The Arkham Mansion, as I mentioned before, is probably my favorite area in the game. Equal parts regal, ostentatious, and completely devoid of charm in a way that High Gothic inspiration indicates. High Gothic is an area or style of building that was generally belonging to churches or places of worship when it was first introduced, centuries before the Victorian era. So the sense of age here is really easy to feel. How different this building is from any anything else on the island is really apparent. The faded velvet carpets are one 
one of my favorite touches, adding a deep red undercurrent to the world here, kind of symbolic at a stretch. The Botanical Gardens is a place unlike any other on the island, meant to inspire some sort of hope in the asylum, conjure some peace, and pay remembrance to the struggles of the past. The presence of flowing water is significant to me here, synonymous with life, but the heavy green filter reinforces the presence of illness as well. Green is a game-long color motif woven into each of the different villains in Asylum, the Venom or Titan formula itself, and it comes to represent Joker's control over the environment to me. We see this filter shift to a pink outdoors when Ivy is the more dominant foe, and the Botanical Gardens represents the epicenter for both of those opposing forces. You've got Joker's Titan lab here, and it's also Poison Ivy's chosen domain. You get the clash of pink and green. The penitentiary has a more medieval feeling to it to me, a feeling or style somehow deeply connected to the colour of this metal. Claustrophobic and stark, a violent clash between British industrialism and modern security tech, the same feeling that the intensive care unit radiates, just in a more potent, focused way. But I'm, I'm trying to use the visuals and the sound here to show off the look and feel of these environments since I have those tools, and hopefully you can see and assess for yourself what the triumphs of these designs are and also the way that they've aged. My opinion of how effective this world is is just as affected by the time it's been since this game released as any other part of the title. I find the square geometry quite rigid and lifeless throughout much of the game. I find that certain areas of the world are obviously much more detailed and interesting than others. And while I understand their place in the game, I honestly truly believe the presence of Riddler trophies and challenges gravely misunderstands the tone of this game and the Riddler's main contribution to it is a constant disruption of atmosphere. You can't walk into any room without some dumb green text emblazoned across the top, seemingly meaninglessly. Get this shit off my screen. Very little about this game properly gets me bent out of shape, but the Joker teeth come pretty damn close. Worst collectible you could have thought of. I don't know why they annoy me this much. I just don't know why they're here. <laughs> Unlike later titles, Riddler's challenges in Asylum don't have puzzles really attached to them, and more often than not, his trophies and scanning challenges are just sitting out in the open, just waiting to be picked up or just sitting in the middle of nowhere. In later games, we'll see Rocksteady wise up a bit and start physically segmenting Riddler away from the rest of the game to, in essence, keep his world and how he challenges the suspension of disbelief as separate from the main story as possible. But the overlap in Asylum is pretty stark and it, it, it just doesn't turn out well. It might be nice to see Easter eggs like Two-Face's Cell or mentions of Calendar Man, Prometheus, Firefly, various other villains, and unlocking in-game material about them serves to stir up interest in the larger Batman universe, even if many of these diary entries and designs are later contradicted or annulled by Arkham Cannon, whatever. These are important aspects of the game's appeal, but they don't need to be associated with the Riddler, and the Riddler trophies are not. It's not valuable to me to say you can unlock and access more trophies fees the further into the game you get because the more gadgets you unlock or whatever because while that's technically true what that actually means is you can spend two hours post story running around with the ultra bat claw just pulling down walls to get a trophy behind them that would have been impossible to put there because there was a wall you can now cross a few gaps with your line launcher to obtain a riddler trophy you have no idea how edward would have put there to begin with because these ideas are taken much much further in later games because there's a level of value and appeal that puzzles add to the game, I find the tone and believability compromises much less annoying in later titles. It's a trade-off, right? Occasionally you have to excuse how trophy placements and riddles don't make sense, but you get to do a cool fun riddle puzzle in this riddler world that you worked to get to if you collect them, so it's it's an exchange, right? In Asylum, trophies are just lazily sitting out in the middle of nowhere, disrupting the otherwise handcrafted atmosphere of each location, failing to combat how empty some of this space feels and what the game gains by including them is negligible. This this is a full-on clash. Why, why is this here? So while the world of Asylum is very detailed and the age of it is really easy to feel particularly, I think the Riddler challenges inside that world might be my handy little stepping stone segue back into the start of these ideas the costs and benefits of valuing the strengths of your project at the expense of your weaknesses. What has that meant for Arkham Asylum? Well, it means that there are obvious mechanics, aspects, disciplines in Arkham Asylum, like the combat, the stealth, 
Batman's detective veneer and general portrayal, the atmospherics and the control on the characters within that are the main show. Those are the things that Rocksteady thought that we'd value, remember and walk away with and it looks like Sefton Hill was completely right. Even while most people do agree that the boss fights are sort of samey, these are the things we still talk about. These are the reasons why we still say that this game is great. But what you might not remember is how lackluster the Riddler challenges are, or how they interrupt tone. Maybe it's a problem, but maybe it doesn't make a big enough impression to last. Maybe one of the weaknesses is how much climbing there is in Asylum, and perhaps how dull it is compared to Uncharted or Assassin's Creed around that time. Climbing isn't an insignificant part of the exploration here. We've got three dedicated sections involving physical ascension. One of them is tackled no less than three times, and yet climbing and parkour, a very popular thing for games at the time, isn't a dot point on the back of the box. Rocksteady he chose, I'm guessing, to not emphasize climbing as a core strength of their game, and focused on other elements of Batman while keeping this important aspect fairly minimal. They didn't make a lot of it. Smartly, it's more about the process of how Batman navigates around environmental obstacles. If he's trapped in a room, how does he find his way out? Asylum places more value on the ideal of Batman being an escape artist than an acrobat his functional movement over fancy movement. It conveys a sense of power and tenacity through his navigation skills more than his physical flair while he's moving. He just jumps across the gap. He doesn't wall run. All business. This is not an advertised strength of Arkham Asylum. Do you remember these uh, these couple of puzzle rooms where you just do some basic jumping and uh, save a couple people? No? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Similarly, even though they're notoriously effective sections, once you get past the spectacle layer, the set pieces of Asylum can kind of fall flat given their lack of tactility or depth. Neither the Killer Croc nor Scarecrow moments in the game actually ask a whole lot of me as a player. Scarecrow is functionally the same as any other climbing moment, just with some sudden death if I get seen, and Killer Croc's lair is an atmospheric treat that wears itself out very quickly. Poison Ivy's effect on the game visually is substantial, but these plant things are just a mild nuisance and don't add anything. Despite that, none of these were bad ways to house or flag these encounters, and they remain effective in some way. It's how Rocksteady relied on and employed their strongest aspects to distract from these sorts of moments, to indeed see where more depth wasn't needed to achieve some effective results that makes Asylum a dynamic, creative experience, and uses the periphery of its design intelligently. Is there an opportunity to expand on how interactive these hallucinations are? Absolutely. Was it needed? Needed at the cost of making the combat more compelling? Well, probably not. The Killer Croc section might feel kind of bare bones once you're into it, but it's a spectacle moment, and it achieves what it's there to do. Nothing more, nothing less, and hopefully, someone's pants will be so full of shit they won't notice the difference. Titan foes are boring as hell and they're used too many times, but another example might be the weak shakeups of stealth. There's two sections in which Batman isn't permitted to be seen by any henchman, but one actually suspends the previous rules of Predator, since hostiles no longer notice their fallen comrades, or there's only one enemy you need to be going for. So it's just a slight change in how the stealth moments are designed to be tackled by removing gargoyles, but also removing freedom without actually expanding on any gameplay whatsoever. Was there an opportunity to change up these encounters in a more meaningful way? 100%. Was it needed? Well, I would say yes, but it appears Rocksteady disagreed for these two particular instances. Riddler challenges, climbing, hallucinations, killer croc, Titan foes, boss fights across the board. Some spaces, particularly maintenance and access hallways and buildings. These Poison Ivy Audrey 2s and Poison Ivy's general gameplay overall. These are examples of moments, isolated sections of gameplay or ideas, which might not have been the most that they could be, but were left as is because they're pretty much effective as they are. Could you add more to this? Yeah, absolutely. Does adding more to it take priority over these other things during development? Over the combat, over the stealth, over how detailed the world is? I guess not. The negative effect on the whole experience by leaving these things the way they are depends on each player in this case. Do you like what you like about this game enough to excuse the cut corners or even walk away remembering what they were? Memory gets selective like that. I think it would be similarly fair to say that despite being undoubtedly one of the best looking games of its time of release, especially for consoles, Rocksteady didn't seem to prioritize the look of their NPCs, their facial animation, or the presentation of their dialogue, particularly shot reverse shot scenes, because not a whole lot of time spent looking at people talk. What's going on? They were talking like they were in control. Is it true that Joker escaped? Unfortunately, yes. 
But not for long. I'd been studying Joker's case for months when he broke out. The Warden was very specific he wanted Joker cured. Bad publicity will affect his campaign for mayor. That'll be the least of it. Looking back, actually, quite a lot of the presentation is quite funny to me. Given how significantly ahead of the competition Arkham would later be in terms of visual presentation, to see the baby version of it here sometimes makes me smile. Gameplay into scene transitions is now in so many titles, it's like a, a staple of AAA. And Rocksteady was so ahead of the curve when they tried it a few times here. In 2009, I still believe that no game improved significantly enough on Arkham Knight's visuals and presentation to knock it off my top spot until The Last of Us Part Two. Arkham Knight remains one of the best looking games of its type yet made, one of the best presented yet made, with only The Last of Us Two topping it, and with God of War a little ways behind. Seeing Rocksteady start to get their reps in here, but present other scenes like this, is like I'm seeing a child walk for the first time. Like, like I'm seeing the idea that maybe they'll throw their weight behind presentation. It's nice, and while this game looks great for the time, the visual presentation of this world or story isn't stealing the show yet or isn't even particularly good sometimes and we'll have to wait until 2015 to see where Rocksteady really take their best ideas in this field. I think there's an awful lot to be gained here from spinning fewer plates, from choosing what you commit to. I've spent a lot of time when covering the Ratchet & Clank games talking about variety for its own sake being the bane of effective design. And the focus is something that I've often appreciated in Rocksteady's approach. Maybe this is where I learned to value it. It makes room for their challenge maps at the very least. Sections of gameplay you can carve out out of context that still feel meaty and enjoyable. It may not be the case for the studio by the time that Arkham Knight rolls around, a game which is so distracted that it seems to not have been streamlined at all. But for Asylum and City, each game's priorities are very obvious and it creates games which usually feel driven to deliver the good stuff hot and fresh. There's a lot to love about what's good about these games. Asylum might as well be an argument against perfectionism. The, this game is what you get when a team decides to be content with certain features being the main event. What's more impressive is that they don't overemploy them to compensate for what isn't. There's the right amount of each and it leaves me always wanting more of the good stuff. I always walk away remembering what was great. But let's be real here. The, the effectiveness of Arkham Asylum kind of isn't in question. This, this world and this, uh, these mechanics and these characters are, and the story is part of an accepted interpretation of Batman. Whether or not the game succeeded and is generally regarded as being good is a ridiculous question. I'm not blowing anybody's mind with that. Every word I've written here, every single thing that I've said is acting under the knowledge the knowledge that Arkham Asylum's legacy has been solidified and that you already know what you think of it. The conversation around this game reached its natural end long ago and there's really nothing more to be said on the game's surface level quality. We have as good an idea on what the consensus is as we're ever gonna have. We might know it's flawed, but this is a game that people love and enjoy, one that's been largely celebrated as a significant title that helped change games in its wake and made way for an even more beloved sequel. And while we all know that it's aged, there's no delusions about the level of polish that it had at the time and how impressive a game this was at the time. Truly, there wasn't enough like this. And we've spent 12 years telling ourselves that. 2009 was the same year as uh, Uncharted 2, Assassin's Creed 2, Bayonetta, Borderlands, Infamous, Dragon Age Origins, Prototype, Ratchet and Clank, A Crack in Time, and of course, who can forget Wet? It was by no means a, a quiet year, is what I mean, with a, with a dense amount of high quality titles coming from a lot of different devs, but I think Arkham Asylum does hold a place in that lofty company. People remember this game, mainly because of the focus that it contained. It might not have been the most exciting or funny or wildest game of that year, but it's for sure one of the most contained, especially compared to other successful superhero games like Infamous and Prototype. I'd also argue it's one of the titles that's aged the best in terms of visuals and playability from titles that I named there. Stepping back to Assassin's Creed 2 or Uncharted 2, games that I pretty much enjoy, is, it's like a cold shock to the system and Asylum is liquid in comparison. We all know this. I'm not, <laughs> regardless, 
I'm not here to affirm Arkham Asylum. I hope I've talked about it positively so far, but I'd rather not frame it at the time in 2009 for longer than I have to. We, we all know all this. It doesn't need it. And if I wanted to play it safe, I would stop now. My subscriber number might triple if I just told you some things you already know. Maybe write a long conclusion paragraph, like a long wind up to my finally dropping the word masterpiece. Hint that the sequel is some kind of perfection and walk away. But I wouldn't really have a reason to come back here to make another video doing the same thing everyone else has done for Asylum. I have more to say than this. There are times when affirmation of the product is necessary, where I don't think discussing the flaws really matters all that much. Anybody familiar with my with my channel who's been here for a while knows that I've wrestled with the need to be more positive about media in general. And even the fact that I'm returning to Arkham at all is a direct result of that. I really, really love this series. It's meant a lot to me for a long time. And back when I made my first video about the whole series, I, that didn't really come across and that was the, the ultimate failing of that video. And I used to think the journey to fix that was obvious, that I'd come back here and just shower love and appreciation over Arkham like I failed to all those years ago. But sometimes the conversation you've got to have isn't the one that you want. And understanding shortcomings of the things that have shaped you is just as important as celebrating the achievements. And I really truly know that y'all have the celebration covered. <laughs> I feel as though my love for this series and these games has become complicated and there's a feeling that this game produces in me that just saying oh i was wrong and it's actually amazing wouldn't express adequately i do love this series and this game but a large part of why is because of how they shaped me how they opened me up to other stories and how they're still such polished products that i can play still it doesn't mean they're perfect in and of themselves it doesn't mean that my perception of them is never allowed to evolve. If if Arkham Asylum was my favorite game at one point, and it was, but it stayed there for 12 years, all that would really tell me is that the things that it opened me up to taught me nothing worth looking back with. What would have been the point of a gateway game if I never moved on? And looking around now at how this game is still talked about today, returning to Arkham Asylum doesn't ask me to affirm it. It asks me to wrestle with ideas inside it that I've willfully ignored for years. And I hope that I can do that for positive reasons. I'm not here to tell you that Arkham Asylum is a masterpiece game. I'm here to talk about valuing strength over weakness. Perhaps it's, it's incidental, or maybe just ironic. But it seems as though it wasn't just a creative approach which shaped Asylum's development, but it may have been an ideology which it came to reflect. And I mean, we're talking about a game based in a psych hospital here. Promoting strength and leaving perceived weaknesses behind to die isn't exactly the most fitting outlook. Some might argue it's the least. Tell me something. You've never let me catch you this season. What are you really after? Well, nothing much. Hundreds dying in pain fears. All their meaningless lives brought to a full by the Oh, Is that the answer you want? You put a uniform on and are given a role, I mean, uh, a job, saying your job is to keep these people in line then you're not, certainly not the same person as if you were in street clothes and in a different role. You really become that person once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick and, you know, you, you act the part. That's your, that's your costume and uh, you have to uh, act accordingly when you put it on. It harms me. Why? I mean harms. I mean in the present tense, it harms me. How did it, it harm you? How does it harm you? Just to think it, about it, it, you mean that people can be like that? It, yeah. It let me in on some knowledge that, that I've never experienced firsthand. Uh -huh. 
I've read about it. I've read a lot about it. But I've never experienced it firsthand. I've never seen someone turn that way. And I know you're a nice guy. You know? You don't do you know understand? That, I do. I do know you're a nice guy. Then why, I don't, then I don't do get that me? because I know what you can turn into. It surprised me that no one said anything to stop me. No one, no one said, Carmen, you can't say those things to me. Those things are, are, are sick. Nobody said that. They just accepted what I said. I said, you know, go tell that man to the face he's the scum of the earth. And they'd do it without question. They'd do push-ups without question. They'd sit in the hole. They'd, uh, they'd abuse each other. And here they're supposed to have a little bit, they're supposed to be together as, as a unit in, in jail, but here they're, they're abusing each other because I requested them to. And no one questioned my authority at all. And it really shocked me. Why didn't people, when I started to get abused people so much, I started to get so profane that, and still people didn't say anything. I took a walk around my island. I passed by the penitentiary and felt nauseous at the thought of the filth it contained. I looked out over the Gotham Bay, and in the distance I saw lights. No doubt boats bringing more filthy degenerates to my city. I swore again to protect her from this darkness. I took my frustrations out on a lone patient. His case notes suggested he was a paranoid schizophrenic. His pleas, as I beat him to death, suggested much more. His confessions were illuminating. My path was clear. I had a sudden pang of conscience. I sought counsel from my priest on the choices I had made. I asked him if it was a sin to kill in order to save a life. The holy man said all life was sacred, but a judgment would not be upon my soul if I acted to save another. I left the confessional with my soul uplifted, convinced more than ever I am doing a service not only to mankind, but to God as well. Schizophrenia, disease of thought disorder, disease of inappropriate emotion, disease of inappropriate attribution of things. And what you'll see is this is not just some sort of generic craziness in the way that that word means nothing whatsoever. There are typical structures to the ways in which things are not working right in the behavior of schizophrenics. Part of what begins to bring that across is the obvious fact that there is no way that schizophrenia is just one disease. We have about 12 to 1300 patients inside off of Emola Avenue, uh, 940 inside the fence. Um, they are what are called the criminally insane, which means they are not only mentally ill, but they've committed a major crime. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Just a little bit of history, or just a, a setup. There are 3,000 assaults per year like I said, inside those, those walls. Uh, patients and staff have been killed. You may have read about that in 2010. I'm gonna tell you about another killing in 2001 that was right outside my office. It wasn't 100 feet from where Donna Gross was murdered, so they've had two murders in exactly that same place. But besides an occasional news story, there's a culture of silence that exists at Napa, which is what I really wanted to address. Everyday emotions were given clinical names. Unhappiness became anhedonia. Thinking became cognition. Facial expressions were affect. Feelings about other people were transferences. People didn't get to know each other or became, become friends. Their boundaries became confused. In this way, ordinary feelings and experiences were made distant and strange. This kind of language kept patients at arm's length, as if they didn't share the same emotions as everyone else. 
Having insight into your illness meant you accepted your psychiatrist's diagnosis and compliance meant you took your medication without having to be forced. It was important to be well adjusted, which meant you complied with your support system. In other words, you followed the rules. Compliance, in fact, was the way out of the hospital. If a patient was compliant enough, they were discharged, which didn't necessarily mean their symptoms had gone away, but that they'd learned to repeat the magic words that led the doors to open. Brian knew what he was supposed to say, but either he couldn't say it or he couldn't say it convincingly enough. Mental illness is seen as a subset of physical illness. You know, the language that's used is the language of science and medicine. And on the one hand, it's really important to take, you know, mental illness as seriously as physical illness and get the same kind of treatment. But on the other hand, mental illness is not just a subset of physical illness. It involves things like spirituality and existentialism and what it means to live in a human body and to have a human mind. and all of those those kinds of human elements are all taken out of the discourse of science diagnosis when he tried to escape he was shot by the police now he was actually doing it because he would rather be in prison or be killed you know it's kind of an attempted suicide by cop and yet all of that was seen as a symptom of his pathology instead of the way i see it is a rational um, response to being in that situation an attempt to to make some kind of change however drastic Often an exercise of freedom, the law of a story in a video game can often act as the one area in which a writer is able to place a stamp of identity unimpeded by any other part of the video game making process, where they don't need to cut down on words because they have to get animated, where they don't have to write about moving the character from one area to another, where they are the most free is in writing the background material a lot of the time. The spirit of Amadeus Arkham Quest of Arkham Asylum offered Paul Dini that chance, and a chance to look into the very heart of this narrative in a way I don't know if Rocksteady ever allowed players again. In the writings etched into these stone tablets hidden all around the asylum, in the monologues of the spirit of Amadeus Arkham Quest, it becomes clear that we're hearing a voice tell the story of Amadeus Arkham's own tragic life, his family being murdered by an insane man that he later begins to treat in an asylum that he builds, that same patient murdering Amadeus Arkham's secretary immediately upon being declared sane. During treatment, Amadeus inadvertently killed that patient and is later committed to his own institution where he died, but before that part of the story is told, the voice we're hearing switches to that of Quincy Sharp, the new warden of the asylum. Committed to rebuilding the asylum and retaking control of Gotham from the degenerates who he says are polluting it, he nakedly admits to a cold-hearted contempt for his charges, the establishment itself showing a nigh impossible level of antipathy for the field of work in which he's found himself. He speaks as though he's the only saviour in sight, standing alone against a torrent of madness threatening the people of his city. He's killed patients, others he detests and plots to murder, most notably Joker himself. Sharp openly, gleefully fantasizes about performing a lobotomy on Harley Quinn at, at the time an asylum doctor and recounts an actual failed attempt to kill the Joker in detail. His crusade to cure patients takes on a remarkably similar tone to that of Victor Zaz in his interview tapes. He's a uh, serial murderer who in his interviews speaks sanctimoniously about his liberation of his victims from their droll, useless lives into a form of salvation that he offers them in death. Yesterday we spoke about the people you killed. Ah, the zombies. They are all people, Victor. They are zombies continuously shuffling through the daily grind, waiting for someone to liberate them. The police report states that you've murdered, or liberated if you like, 
20 young women in the last three months. Each had her throat slit and was left posed. They were all lucky to be chosen to receive my gift. I doubt they would agree with you. Really? How can I let a dirty animal like this live? He is the cancer I have sworn to protect the city from. Now, reminder, Quincy Sharp is the warden of the asylum. This is the response that Batman has to learning all of this. I trust that through my writings, you will do what is right. Please, I implore you, continue my work. This city deserves a savior. Continue my work. Researching this quest online or reading the eventual in-game description of the Spirit of Amadeus Arkham quest sheds light on what this is supposed to be. That Quincy Sharp suffers from a form of multiple personality disorder, believing himself to be possessed by the spirit of Amadeus Arkham, somehow preserved by the asylum itself, and whose murderous intent is that of a second, possibly supernatural, psychopathic personality about which he may not even be aware. He's harmless, he's a bureaucrat, and the reason he's killed people is because of this affliction in his head, which the law now treats basically as being an entirely different person. Sharp's motivation or reason for the abuse of patients is seemingly nothing more than enacting punitive retribution. Because they're filthy, they deserve abuse for abuse's own sake. The ends he's hoping to achieve have nothing to do with the specific crimes a patient may have committed. His hatred is of the disease. His target is the disease. That it's attached to a person is of no consequence. Now, I'm not really here to discuss the uh, medical accuracy of this portrayal of dissociative identity disorder in any great depth or with any real authority. I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's fine because by the looks of things, no one who worked on this game was either. But while it's true that certain alters, meaning separate identities of those with this disorder, aren't often aware of what the other alters are doing, what's more sure is that in terms of mental health demonization, it doesn't really get more textbook than that to take a kernel of truth, something that sounds like it maybe could happen, and then contort it, twist it in the worst possible direction. But even if Sharp is a man who has a mental problem himself, which causes him to kill, Arkham Asylum, the game, in this context and in further ones too, is kind of saying that the reason for any crime to exist in Gotham is because of mental health disorders. That stance is clarified in the game's own haste to excuse Sharp's criminality as being a direct result of his own mental deterioration. The two concepts, mental health and misdemeanor, are the same. Zaz and Sharp are comparable and Batman's silence when it comes to Sharp in particular exposes a classist distinction also. But why does crime exist in Gotham? Easy, because there is mental disease in Gotham. Even if a criminal in this game uh, doesn't have a mental health disorder, they follow somebody who does. You're a more dangerous criminal, a more notorious, imposing, and violent one, the more of a head case you are. The fear that you evoke is directly correlated to the strangeness of your mind. With the Joker, the most el elusive one being presented as the tip of that spear, the, the peak of the mountain, the most dangerous because he's the most crazy. These looks into what Arkham Asylum thinks of mental health and its relationship to violence is very clear, as well as how it says it should be treated. It's really worth emphasizing just the gravity of this idea that Quincy Sharp isn't just a character who is a murderer. He runs the whole place. He hires everyone there. He decides what gets built, what the protocols are. His word is law when it comes to how Arkham Asylum treats the criminally insane and the mentally ill in totality. And it's safe to assume that the beliefs which cause him to kill patients could be the same beliefs on which he bases his operation of the asylum day to day. What it says about Batman and a player's relationship to any of this is even more concerning. And while there's no point trying to cancel a game, it, it's way past due that we talked about this. So what's the deeper deal here? Let's talk about it. Well, 
in the United States, to the best of my knowledge. A defendant in the legal system is sent to a psychiatric facility or is treated as being criminally insane for one of two reasons usually, both to do with insanity in relation to a crime that they've committed. One is the insanity plea, stating that the perpetrator can't be held fully responsible for their actions, be it a murder or an assault, because of their condition at the time the crime was committed. The reasons someone might be deemed insane are very complicated and very dependent on the person at hand and requires expert analysis. The second reason is if during the trial for the crime, the defendant is found to be unfit to stand trial because of their condition. You were either insane when you did it or insane when they were sentencing you, and instead of being sent to a prison, you were sent to a psychiatric hospital to serve time while being treated for the condition, presumably without the presence of which no crime would have taken place. Mental illnesses of this severity are very complicated, to the point where understanding them is still a very fluid field of research. Most of our understanding of mental health happened in the 20th century. These are illnesses which alter somebody's perception of reality, of themselves and of others. The world you see, the sounds you hear, the air you think you breathe is not categorized in the same ways and not named or connected in the same ways and empathizing with extreme cases of these illnesses is extremely challenging because many people truly never will understand what it's like to be told that the world as they see it and hear it and think about it simply is not real. We can diagnose that schizophrenia, for instance, a, a disease that asylum makes continual reference to, is a disease of thought disorder, a complex brain disease which alters what a person perceives to be real, information that they receive about reality. Perhaps many schizophrenics who commit violent crimes, which is a fraction of the percentage of people who have the illness, maybe they believed when they committed a crime they were acting in self-defense because of what their brain was telling them. We can't tell them that's still murder because without the condition they may have understood that situation very differently and maybe nobody would have been hurt. They don't need to be punished for their illness but that's what sending an insane person to a prison would inevitably be. We can examine it on a clinical level, on a scientific level, but because it's about a person's brain it's also intertwined with their personality, their culture, the way that they were raised the people they interact with, their occupation, their routine, their religion, their hobbies, interests, it touches everything they believe. Understanding a crime committed by someone who thinks the world is a way that it isn't, but is very real to them, is a very complex, very personal process that kind of has to go back to square one. To cut a line for them between how their brain perceives reality from what reality actually is, when for many of us, there's no difference. The distinction might be complicated, and for any onlooker, I think it cuts a humanitarian stripe through the middle of a vicarious process we have of being able to judge someone who's done something awful. True crime is a very popular genre of everything, and the payoff for sitting through hearing about what the defendant did is learning how long their prison sentence was. You know, yeah, take it. Ending on insanity seems to, if anything, feel like an underwhelming result. We want someone to pay. We want to feel justified in the disgust, and this end offers no answers. I want concrete motivation, dude. Tell me you killed your wife because she slept with someone else. Killed your teacher because they hit you. Not something wrong with your head that I don't know how to feel. That's not good enough to me. Someone wanting entertainment. Insanity seems to tell us that there has to be levels to our judgment. Nuance to the hate by tinting it with understanding and acquiescing it as mere revulsion or sympathy for killers. These are people who need help, not punishment, and help and understanding that the every person simply doesn't know how to offer or feel. There's a second option though, the opposite, and it's one that Batman stories began employing in the 1970s. Batman stories began to take a turn away from their campier, more kid-friendly approach as the comics code was becoming more lax, and turned to more realistic tints for their characters. And mental illness at that time was used as a device to create more fear for a villain. They're just not scary enough if they're normal, they've got to be fucked in the head because it makes them weirder. If they're harder to understand, they don't even feel human, they're just fucking monsters. By adding a layer of psychology, Batman stories did the opposite of what mental disorders should evoke from an audience and used it as a device to further contort their villains and justify, quote marks, even more violent crimes. To stigmatize mental health as a bad aspect of bad characters instead of as a sympathetic aspect of real people. Batman and Batman stories still kind of conveniently ignore focusing on the supposed insanity of their rogues with any real depth or humanity, even whilst 
touting psychology as a buzzword for their tone and style. In the most obvious cases of Two-Face or Riddler, diagnoses of split personalities or of obsessive compulsive disorders are so broad and unrealistic, they're just deeply misinformed. But Joker in particular has avoided any kind of concrete diagnosis for most of his history, and there's a very cynical way to look at that. By avoiding putting a definitive name on what's wrong with the guy, it helps us continue to vilify him instead of dwell on ourselves and think about what enjoying the story about a definitely sick person getting beaten actually is. Batman stories can fall back into that non-specificity of psychological disorders as a method to avoid the human situation going more in-depth would put them in. That's cowardice. And their stories and Arkham Asylum work very hard to avoid employing psychology on any actual level besides entertainment because capitalizing on stigma and relying on an audience's unfamiliarity with psychosis is easy and the alternative is terrifying. But it is important at the end of the day and important to me to get the semantics right. The people sent to psych wards in real life simply aren't criminals if they've been deemed by a judge to not have been responsible for the event on the grounds of insanity. Their condition means they can't be held responsible. They're very truthfully and maybe frustratingly, but in a very real sense, not guilty. This delineation alone is something that Batman I don't think has ever made clear in my experience. If Joker has been deemed insane, he is not a criminal according to the law. His affliction is to blame. Except for the transferred black gay convicts here, maybe nobody living on the grounds of Arkham Asylum at all is a criminal according to the law. There are a few more things to be aware of in regard to psych sentencing. The first is that while prison sentences often have time periods attached with parole being an option for early release, in some cases sentencing to a state hospital these days is indefinite. An involuntarily sentenced patient is there until they die or until they are well, and when they're deemed well is a very difficult thing to calculate. Second is that a patient of a psych hospital has many kinds of rights. Importantly, they have a right to treatment, which ensures that they'll actually receive proper care once they're admitted they're not just going to get ignored. The second important right that a patient has is actually the opposite, the right to refuse treatment. A hospital actually isn't allowed to treat a patient against their will except by court order, especially when it comes to their body or procedures or medicines that they're taking. There are exceptions to the rules, mostly to do with emergency treatments, but ongoing medicines can't be given against the consent of the patient. Patient rights and dignity is a very important area for psych wards. A, a lot of heavy prescribed medications for some illnesses can have long-lasting physiological effects and patients might be worried about that so they're still afforded freedom over their bodies even if it means that their stay in a hospital would basically be extended longer and longer if they continue refusing to take their meds. Importantly though while a psych hospital may not be a prison I certainly don't have any experience personally in any of these places but from the reading that I've done there simply isn't any other way to explain some of some psych hospitals then the end of the road. In 2014, uh, Dr. Steven Seeger published a book called Behind the Gates of Gomorrah, which detailed his experiences as a doctor running a unit at California's Napa State Hospital, one of five in the state. He speaks at length about the frequency of assaults within the walls, counting them at 10 a day. Whether that's of patients or of staff, it's part of the daily process to fear for your safety while working or living in those units. In 2015, the Tampa Bay Times and the Herald Tribune launched a full-scale investigation into mental hospitals in the whole state of Florida, finding that after over a hundred million dollars in budget cuts, the level of security offered to any staff or patients at these institutions was as low as the amount of transparency that they were required to provide to the affected families about workplace violence or accidents, which is basically none. People die in these places. People are injured, they're attacked and killed in these places. They abuse each other, abuse themselves. High suicide rates, high assault rates, low funding, even lower internal safety protocols. And sometimes hospitals are under no obligation to be forthcoming about it in public. The powers running these places seem so decentralized that finding any one person who's responsible for what happens seems almost impossible. It's a place where people who can't be responsible for themselves are kept after all. Dr. Seeger admits in no uncertain terms that any staff or patients active in side wards at Napa State is never alone and relies on the goodwill of other patients to step in if something is going wrong. 
and he calculates that the likelihood of you being assaulted while working there for a single day is over 60%. If you work there for a year, it's guaranteed. But what happens to a person who's already been found insane when they assault or kill somebody in a ward? Where else do you send them? There isn't anywhere else to go. They're already where the state says that they belong and where they're supposed to be getting the help that they need. It's the end of the road. And they're there to be treated, to live their lives, and nobody wants the worst for any of them. In those individual relationships, the stories of one doctor speaking to one patient and seeing improvement over a matter of months, it seems easy to understand. But it's how big it gets, how unindividual this can feel, where the humanity that I want for the situations of any one person in a system like this begins to be destroyed by the distance that scientific, economic, or political language creates. The impersonal nature of it, the way that hospitals feel so secret and so divided from society, it others their inhabitants so fully. And bureaucracy can seem scared to confront that on a level which would help improve the operation of these places where sick people are often put while the rest of the world actively forgets about them. The will to forget them is impossibly strong already, and now there's even more standing in the way. In converting such a place to fiction, it's not the wrong move to include abusive staff, to show off budgetary constraints making things dangerous, ineffectual amounts of funding, outdated environments. It would probably be something of an erasure to pretend the way that it's done today is ideal. In some ways, as anyone who's played the game might be able to guess, Arkham Asylum is way off the mark, and in others, at least statistically or anecdotally, it's sometimes pretty uncomfortably close, particularly if we cast our eyes backward in history. It's a 500 bed establishment apparently, which is a pretty accurate number to the size of uh, some hospitals in real life. It's also a much older building that might be suitable today, converted from the architecture of a mansion and retrofitted with newer security systems. Arkham's buildings are each inspired, like I mentioned, by a different era of Gothic, High Gothic or Victorian style architecture. Each place was built at a different time, the mansion first, gardens next, I'm guessing the penitentiary, medical and intensive care in that order, on top of catacombs which predate any of it by decades. Each building is meant to serve a different purpose, while the older ones were left as they are and foundational weaknesses or hazardous areas are simply marked off with red tape. On paper, this does have some similarities to psych wards built in the 1800s, which somewhat resemble college campuses of the day, or of how its island location mirrors how some hospitals would strive to become their own self-sustaining cities, including farms and classes and dorms, so that anyone who wasn't fit to live outside the walls could still be part of a pocket society which relied on itself. You had an occupation tilling or sewing or repairing, it just happens to still be on the grounds of the facility. The aura of history and a separation from normal, adjusted society in which patients are kept at arm's length, away from normalcy to an othering extent, just feels historically accurate. These hospitals in real life can also be dangerous, and back in centuries past, mental illnesses were barely understood, to the point where faith, God and the devil was brought up in curation or causation more often than science. People were getting driven mad or were being tortured or punished or possessed by supernatural powers. That's the only explanation, because we don't understand what you're talking about, dude. But given the Arkham series' focus on consistently feeling out of time, trying to elude any particular time period, let's start putting dates on some of this stuff. Those kinds of beliefs are as far back in medical fields as the 1400s. I don't think Arkham is based in the 1400s. Or on the opposite end of the spectrum, things we now have a far better understanding of, particularly in the fields of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, symptoms like those were seen as being indicators of much deeper illnesses than they actually were in the 1800s, particularly for women, with certain entirely common emotional behaviors being severely psychoanalyzed and even more severely treated. There wasn't even really an understanding of how mental illnesses could be different from each other, 
as if all the ailments were ultimately the same underlying madness. However, physicians and psychiatrists such as Philippe Pinel began writing in more detail about mental health and disorders, beginning to understand that madness was not always continuous and started to attempt to diagnose and label different symptoms or stages of derangement. Pinel began to call for more humane treatment of the mentally ill as early as 1794. I don't think Arkham is based in 1794. Later down the line, Emil Kraepelin, often known as the father, I should probably look up how his name is pronounced, let me get that right. Emil Kraepelin, it's Emil Kraepelin, I'm sorry. Emil Kraepelin, often known as the father of modern psychiatry, began to speak about genetic components to mental illnesses, the need to uh, specifically diagnose different distinct disorders so as to predict their progression, and also to take individual personalities and age into account when discussing conditions. He advocated for or the field of psychiatry being taken more seriously as a medicinal field. He spoke about the importance of observing patterns in patients over time rather than symptoms at a glance as one might with physical illnesses when trying to diagnose what was wrong. Among many achievements, Kraepelin is credited with having classified both schizophrenia and bipolar, previously known as manic depression, and while his processes have since been updated, his work at the end of the 1800s and into the early 20th century greatly forwarded psychiatric thinking before Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud in the mid-1900s, with Kraepelin not only further condemning the mistreatment of patients in asylums throughout his career, but arguing against imprisonment and capital punishment for the criminal insane while he founded his own institution. It's also worth noting that Kraepelin's career was once seen in many ways as political, not to the point where he ran for offices, but in that his teaching at different universities, sitting on scientific boards, dealing with royalty and large funding bodies, it put him and his scientific work in touch with influential people of his day. His work into the 1920s was seen as growing in importance. This was something that important people were paying attention to, not only with their eyes, but with their study and their wallets. Even while scientific progression and advocation for patient rights was ongoing and significant for centuries, there were still popular treatments for mental illnesses which took the fore as recently as the 1950s, which are now seen as being inhumane. Insulin shock therapy was one such treatment, specifically for those with schizophrenia that was popularly used throughout the 40s and 50s. It involved injecting patients with large enough amounts of insulin daily to leave them in comatose states for weeks. While results were varied, it was easier to see as a physical treatment for doctors and medical staff, buying psychiatry some form of medicinal legitimacy, even despite how inhumane we understand it to be today. Other, much safer drug treatments were devised in the 70s, with insulin shock therapy eventually being phased out. These treatments also included lobotomies, a form of brain surgery which cut connections in a patient's brain, and specifically their frontal lobe, the place we now understand the will to live and personality to come from. This was a common way to treat extreme cases of derangement, even while significant side effects were continually observed alongside the procedure's use, risks were very high and results were imprecise and varied. In no uncertain terms, the object of this surgery was to remove someone's sense of self while leaving them alive. Lobotomies were banned in the Soviet Union in 1950 and found by US government official investigation under Jimmy Carter sometime later to have actually been used to control minorities and limit the rights of the ill. That's even after Rosemary Kennedy, eldest sister to the would-be President John F. Kennedy, was subjected to a lobotomy in 1941 by her own father when she was just 23 years old. It left her unable to speak, needing 24-hour care for the remainder of her life into her 80s, and moved her mind backward to the state of a two-year-old. Thinking about this procedure makes me want to cry. And a reminder, it's the procedure that Quincy Sharp gleefully fantasizes about performing on Harley Quinn. 
who was at the time an employee of his, a qualified nurse at the asylum, and someone who, in the Arkhamverse, to my knowledge, has never been diagnosed with a mental disorder. Not that that would make this any less unthinkable. The 1960s and 70s focused on deinstitutionalization in the US, with major pushes to find ways to help patients, not necessarily the criminally insane, but those with mental disorders, just help people with mental illnesses manage their own lives and their conditions without the need to be in hospitals at all. In the 1950s, there were over half a million patients in psych hospital beds across the country. In 2018, that number was somewhere closer to 37,000. To get even more specific with dates, from a historical point of view, the construction of Arkham Asylum doesn't really follow the Kirkbride plan, a system of asylum construction which was devised in combination with Dorothea Dix's call for specialized housing for the insane in the United States. The Kirkbride plan specifically designated ways to prioritize patient comfort, access to natural light and the accompanying housing of staff, none of which is observable on Arkham Island. The plan was most popular from the 1850s to the end of the century. However, Dix's work establishing compassionate care for patients made strides for regulated levels of care on top of general psychiatry advocating for patient rights at the same time. Now, it's difficult to find in-game information which actually specifies when the asylum was founded by Amadeus Arkham. However, it's said that he administered fatal doses of electroshock therapy to the institution's very first patient before being admitted himself. Electroconvulsive therapy was first performed in 1938, the year before Batman's first comic book appearance as it happens. So even despite the Victorian style late 1880s architecture seen in most of the medical buildings, we can pretty safely assume the asylum wasn't founded until the late 30s at the absolute earliest. Now, we know from the story of Arkham that the asylum was actually closed down for a time before being reopened three years prior to the events of Arkham Asylum. Canonically, Arkham Asylum takes place in Batman's 10th or 11th year of operation, so it's somewhat safe to assume that he's been continually bringing people to the institution for all of its current operation whilst building his Batcave there by himself. I know some of the details of Batman's career outside of the Arkham games is shown in supporting comics and media, stuff that I'll refer to when relevant when I'm aware of them. Regardless, the time period of when the asylum was built and founded, the 1930s I'm guessing, it actually employed much older architectural techniques than that time. And we can also assume and see that it's not very well maintained. The asylum was probably opened in the late 30s, the 40s, but with lobotomies up in the air, with modern security technology around things like assault rifles being common, the modern feel of the surrounding world occupies Arkham Asylum, while it, the asylum itself, is a hodgepodge of architecture seen from anywhere at the end of the 1800s to all the way back to high gothic influence seen anywhere from the 11s to the 1300s, with patient housing feeling distinctly out of date with its use of shackles and confined cells being seen, things which were eradicated in the US with the use of the Kirkbride plan, specifications to which most asylums adhered post-1850. Taking the viewpoint of the US's approach to psychiatric treatment, Arkham Asylum's construction sits hundreds of years earlier than its treatment practices, which if I had to guess, even though I know barely anything about this field, I would place at the 1960s at the latest. Splitting the difference. The buildings here, late 1800s. Patient housing though, is early 1800s. The staff and the people are from the present day, and the institution is practicing psychiatric techniques employed in the 1950s. The point is that we saw big influential thinkers moving the psychiatric field well into the 20th century, with long-standing continuous pushes to house and treat patients in hospitable places which aided recovery continuously for several hundred years before that. People pushed for that. An Arkham Asylum presents a world where those pushes to treat the mentally ill well stopped 200 years before the game takes place in regard to buildings and where scientific theory and approaches to psychiatry froze about 60 years ago. A lot of this is up in the air, but brass tacks, we're playing in a world that doesn't care about the mentally ill well enough to house them well or treat them properly at all. Doesn't care about treating the mentally ill well at like a basic level. That's the world we're in, not just the asylum, the world we're in.
what's definitive and what's for sure impossible to find in this game is really anybody talking about much of that. A member of staff who actually mentions the patient that they've helped. Basically anybody here who's trying to help. If we observe the dominance of security forces on the island and how far back the construction of cell blocks and buildings go, we know what the priority is here. The asylum wasn't built to treat, it's to trap, it's to contain. There may be a garden here to inspire some hope, to lend one peaceful touch of greenery to this slow cobblestone tomb, but there's no evidence that any of this actually works. There is no reason presented either that this has to be the way that it is. I can read about governmental budget cuts to real estate hospitals all day, but Arkham doesn't tell me this place isn't funded well. What's the context which made this place what it is and why has it stayed this way if it's not actually helping anyone? Which of its failings is willful? Why is this institution stuck so fully in the past and why does nobody seem to care about how that affects people? Now, asylum painting crime and mental health with the same uh, incarceratorial brush isn't an inherently flawed stance if it was hoping to offer comment on that tension, on the ineffectuality of certain types of incarceration in a rehabilitation cycle, to ask the audience why a legal system might treat criminals and afflicted people the same when it clearly doesn't work for anybody. I mean, why is Killer Croc even here? Dude has a physical disease, not a mental affliction. An asylum, a psych hospital, is not a prison. They're not the same thing. This is important to get right, and it would be interesting if Asylum was actually calling attention to that stigma within its narrative. But with the visual storytelling implying that virtually any and every one of Batman's rogues gallery having been housed here at some point or another, even those later depicted as remarkably sane, Asylum conflates punishment and recovery, but doesn't seem to want to acknowledge, much less grapple with the fact that that is what it's doing. Killer Croc is here because he fits tonally, and a sequence can be designed with him in it narrative implication of treating a diseased man like a literal animal be damned. I know this is all architecture, I know it's all dates and history and the past and it might be hard to see the point, but that's exactly the kind of distance that I'm talking about. A distance from reality that Arkham Asylum is trying to build between a player and the humans that these buildings house while it's trying to tell a story involving them, about them. These are cells that they put people in. These are supposed to be for people while they get better. But if you're asking me to be admitted to the asylum and stay here for any amount of time would be tantamount to sustained torture. Indefinitely. Torture until you are well. And it's not as if we're not aware of that when we play the game. We're just not interpreting it to the ends that we should be. What is that actually saying? To close the distance, I think a lot of us actually, by now, already have an understanding of how difficult it is to be locked up in even a comfortable space for an extended period of time. Much less buildings that people 200 years ago looked at and went, yeah, no, absolutely not. At least in Victoria, in Australia, the experiences that I've had of COVID lockdowns over the past two years that we went into intermittently, often without warning, has had a sustained and collective substantial effect on so many people that I'd call it community trauma. I, I like my house, but I don't live my life the same anymore. And that's an experience that a lot of people all over the world have now that I'm asking you to draw from. Even with all the amenities, all the beds and the pets and the sunshine, being find anywhere when you don't know when you'll get released. You don't even understand what you can do to make your world better on your own underneath the crushing weight of an illness you really can't fight. Without human contact, little to no hope of seeing your loved ones holding their gaze and laughing with them over a meal. Can't go to your favorite places and just waste a day. No ability to plan a future without something unforeseen getting in your way. Being confined anywhere fucking sucks, much less this. You want to tell me that this world building is complete and compelling and I just don't believe you. I don't believe you because I don't see people here. I don't see anyone, you know, coping with tragedy with comedy. A human response to trauma like this often is levity and no one is taking anything in stride. I see one self-serious tone equating having living with a mental illness to just a permanent frown or an animalistic scream instead of a human condition that we can have a bunch of different reactions to that we can talk about, we can joke about, we can understand, feel pain and laughter with. 
I don't believe you because I don't see any examples of culture, no examples of how mental illness or recovery might impact the life of someone who speaks English as a second language, or whose religion offers solace or complications to it. Patients whose parental upbringing played a part in how their symptoms began to manifest, trauma that they experienced as a young adult that they later repressed, anyone's journey here. In fact, I don't believe you because there are no patients in Arkham Asylum who are able to speak for themselves or are listened to without being dismissed wholesale when they do. I don't believe you because Arkham Asylum wants me to hate mental illness and anyone with one. The world building isn't complete and it isn't compelling, world building, because it's not built with a mind to fill it with people as if it's a place. It's built with a mind to make a game that enhances one, just one person, and never we mind who it leaves behind in the fiction. Everything is built around that. And the confirmation bias, which is blinded anyone to say that this world building is even close to good enough is a high horse that needs its, its reality checked. Don't tell me this world is whole. Tell me the truth. Its every corner is built to demonize, degrade, and dehumanize while building up the protagonist, and we're not supposed to notice or care about that. Don't tell me this game's influential. When we set the bar for it this fucking low, there aren't people here. Where it's most obviously inaccurate to a real psych ward, even anachronistically, is the identity of the patients here and the general cast of the game. There's what, five women in the game? Only one of those is a patient and the two who oppose you are hypersexualized in what becomes a series long outlook on women which I'd like to keep track of as I cover these games. For now, I want to note there are no women who are regular hostiles that Batman confronts over the course of any of these games, with objectification of women being particularly heavy-handed in Asylum and City. In Arkham Asylum, there's only one woman who's being treated at the facility. Uh, there's frequent discussion of sexual harassment of women by the hostiles in the game, and there are no on-screen women who aren't taken hostage by a man at some point. Looking at the game with a racially aware lens also leaves a lot to be desired, unless you count green, there are no women of colour to speak of at all, despite at least two of the five women in the game, both Kimberly Brooks as Oracle and Cree Summer as Penelope Young, both being performed by women of colour. Additionally, while there are some Blackgate prisoners who are of colour, no patient housed in the asylum is a person of colour at all, and no one here is physically disabled. So dissimilar from psych wards in real life which are co-ed, housing all genders and all people in the same location, Arkham Asylum is seemingly either a white male only facility which is made an exception for Poison Ivy, or the male population of Gotham, the able-bodied male population of Gotham, is doing quite badly. We do, of course, already know why those things are the way that they are. I don't need to spell any of that out any further. But putting that to the side for just one second, I just want to double back again and focus on how dirty this game did Penelope Young, and why I'd say steadfast and staunchly that killing Penelope Young was the single biggest storytelling mistake that Rocksteady ever made. What a fascinating character, and what potential she had for the series. The Titan formula, her work mutating and enhancing the Venom strain is the beating heart of the rest of the series, and evicting the depth of this character from the future of her own story has always felt, always felt like a deep, deep failure. This is a character who like breached the very code of ethics that she swore as a doctor, something she believed would help and protect people to come. She was deluded. She was misled by a devious warden, abused and hounded by another man. She was tricked and manipulated into creating justifications for deeply wrong things. The parallels to Batman in those details are immense. You can see her failure, you can see her torment and self-aggrandization, her arrogance even, but the nobility driving her actions was undeniably born of desperation in some part, and she actually didn't need anyone else to tell her to stop experimenting on people. Batman didn't step in, he wasn't needed. Her own morality returned, her own terror at what she'd created and how she'd done it is in here. She tried to resign, she tried to leave, I choose to believe that's humanity. I'll give the game the benefit of the doubt on this character all day, because I really love it. I think she's performed brilliantly too. Dr. Penelope Young is perhaps one of the only redeemable or sympathetic characters in this entire game. Certainly one of the only ones with an arc or dynamic or some degree of subtlety in her decision making. She's the heart of this game and of this asylum and potentially the rest of the series too. She has a real goal to help those who need it but it's wrapped in layers of malpractice and self-importance and underneath all of that it's just fear. 
a quivering mess of a woman who is scared of the danger her desire to help has put her in, so afraid that the only response was to suppress, crush, hide behind science, create distance from her patients. Dr. Young is only in half a dozen scenes of Arkham Asylum. Her character design so underserves her importance in the story. It, it took me years to realize how important her contribution was to this series. She invented Titan. Imagine the arc she could have had. The ongoing relationship and contrast with Batman had Rocksteady placed the right emphasis on her, included her in the sequels. We'll truly never know, and I think it was a stupid, stupid waste. And it's something the series itself never seems to wake up to, to the point where I don't know if she's verbally mentioned at all after this game. And much of Origins does its best to forget her and annul the value of her work in-universe. In his renowned 2007 book, The Lucifer Effect, American psychologist Philip Zimbardo writes about the nature of evil, specifically how those among us who are morally good or neutral can be coerced into doing evil things by societal pressure. He does this largely through reflection and recounting of his own ill-fated and widely criticized 1970s Stanford prison experiment and analyzing the similarities of its findings to other examples of evil in the world in his book. To bolster that, Zimbardo was later, as a result of his research, brought on board an international case as an expert witness in the trials brought against several members of the CIA and the US Army as a result of torture seen at their hands in Iraqi prison Abu Ghraib during the Iraq War. Zimbardo saw striking similarities in how the power dynamics of a prison warped the minds of the guards who caused great suffering in those they were guarding, and rejected the initial reaction to those prison guards as being a few bad apples. This went directly against the declarations by certifiably heartless Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld that the guards behavior was entirely the fault of those guards. Zimbardo researched the events and testified at how systemic issues within the American military and governmental forces overseeing the Iraq war had actually influenced and indoctrinated the guards and sort of influenced their mistreatment of the prisoners. Somehow, the situation surrounding them meant that they couldn't see what they were doing as evil because they were so far removed from the context of normal, acceptable society and were so far into the world of an occupying force which othered those prisoners so fully that none of it seemed wrong to them. To see the publicized images of those events, understanding how any of those guards could see what they did as being anything but evil defies the imagination, but my imagination is that of a comfortable Westerner who lives in very removed circumstances. Zimbardo wasn't excusing their behavior, but his research speaks to how those guards, or how anybody, could be influenced by a controlled environment to become someone those outside of that environment would be shocked by. Zimbardo and his book investigates the importance of understanding situational forces of power on an individual's perception of their own behavior. We can't just look at the acts, we have to look at the surrounding circumstances to more fully understand how they saw their own actions within a very particular emotionally charged context. The Stanford Prison Experiment, run by Zimbardo, itself was a 1971 study, including 24 student-aged volunteers being held within a mock prison at Stanford University. Those were some post-experiment interview clips that I showed you earlier. Each of those volunteers was randomly assigned as either a prisoner or a prison guard. Originally designed to take place over two weeks, uh, the experiment was to investigate if a group of like-minded 
comparable people could begin to exhibit psychological changes relevant to their assigned roles while within the prison. To quote the book, the research will attempt to differentiate between what people bring into a prison situation from what the prison brings out in them. Will their roles change their personalities? Putting good people in an evil situation to see who or what wins, end quote. As you can probably guess, or as you may have heard given this experiment's notoriety, they did. The, the students began to fall into very clear categories of prisoner or guard, creating a power dynamic based on nothing but their names, and it eventually reached a boiling point. The experiment was called to a stop after six days, as a result of growing brutality against the prisoners on part of the guards. Beds had been taken away, bathroom access was removed, as were people's clothes and privacy. Prisoners were only referred to by their assigned numbers, stripping them of their identity and individuality. Even after resistance attempts on their part, physical and psychological humiliation led to the emotional breakdowns of at least two prisoner volunteers leading to their early release. With the beginnings of further physical abuse escalating, including the beginnings of sexual abuse, and after having been directly challenged by colleague Christina Maslow, exposing Zimbardo's own psychological changes as essentially being the prison warden, the experiment was ended before things got even worse. While the experiment's scientific value has long been questioned given how unethically run it was, its findings are still noteworthy in the field of social theory when taking into account how leadership within social dynamics alters how followers identify with ideologies, as well as how power dynamics and situations can inform not just the presence of evil within a space, but the fluid nature of personality in general in response to power. Like how you might behave if you were with your friends as opposed to how you are with your parents. Right? It's pretty normal. As an extreme example of it, the Stanford Prison Experiment captures that same attention and gives a morbid look into the situational forces which could prompt a good-natured, ordinary university student to begin behaving in a way completely counteractive to a collective interest with anyone else, or even their own personality. And even further, these results give a look into how extended time exposed to backward ideological motivations led by an egotistical capitalist agenda of a handful of men in the White House could indirectly teach members of governmental branches that international human rights violations were fun. The reasons that I find the Stanford Prison Experiment and Zimbardo's larger work to be fascinating, given the context of Batman and of Arkham Asylum or City specifically, should be obvious. These are games not only about the nature of power structure, but the first two also take place specifically within prison environments, one in which analysis of situational forces could be a narratively rich endeavour in a way that few games could be. Asylum itself is almost as if a simulation of a Stanford experiment was allowed to run and run and run on its own, with a fight between guards and prisoners eventually becoming what we see in the game. A psychological reading in the context of Zimbardo's ideas is very applicable to this game within its fiction, but also as a meta reading of how a player is asked to engage with it. So let's deal with that first, the meta. Batman is a very popular but also a very flexible character. He can be depicted in all manner of respects, from a rather complete version of the man Bruce Wayne, such as the one seen within the first two Nolan films that I've discussed before. His motivations can be admirable and his choice is sympathetic, or we can get the version seen in the White Knight series of comics, who is radically more violent and nakedly self-aggrandizing, painted in a way that's deliberately distant from an audience's viewpoint. But in a lot of ways, Batman is still, despite the opportunities, easy to paint as being the ultimate cop which can even happen on accident if the writers aren't careful. A man who thinks he knows the law and enforces it as he sees fit. He might not always fight lethally, but he is a vigilante. He does operate in conjunction with a law enforcement institution often, whilst being a rich benefactor who kind of can't be held to account. He's a mega cop, and given how underwritten he is in the game, he's a mega cop in Arkham Asylum, who the player is asked to kind of inhabit. It's fun to think about how easy it can be for designers to tell players what to do by just giving the player a role to fill, at least from an objective point of view, objective meaning the thing you're supposed to be accomplishing. Power structure within a dichotomy is often all that the info that's needed to give to a player to have them immediately start behaving in a certain way. Are you a crewmate or are you an imposter? 
The difference in the word eventually becomes all you need to know to start scheming or looking for schemers. What's the deeper reason we're so willing to step into that structure, to behave in the way who we're told we are implies that we should. This applies to Batman playing as the mega cop who's already inside a correctional facility. We know, stepping into here, immediately who the good and bad guys are. We know what we're allowed to do and what we're supposed to do just because we're Batman. But because you're not a regular guard, you're Batman, the guidelines, even though they may abuse and slowly go beyond as regular guards that exist for a guard or a cop, they don't exist for Batman at all. Your power is even greater in this context because you're on their side, yet you have no duty of care to anybody. The only difference though between Batman and a regular guard is the name. You're also not an inmate, so you're not on their side either. You don't suffer as one of them necessarily until you do. Encountering Scarecrow puts you at his mercy, right? Walking around Killer Croc's place puts Batman at a disadvantage. Poison Ivy has certain methods of power. The state of vulnerability that Batman might be subjected to of facing a villain who has even a modicum of power over him is variable, as is his role, whereas for an inmate that would be a constant. A true patient of the asylum would continuously feel that pressure of being in fear of someone who is above them in this environment, of having their mind be putty in the hands of someone you don't want to give it to. And because of that role the player is asked to fulfill is such a lone station but is of such power, as a matter of course simply by playing the game, a player might begin to exercise the same psychological phenomena that the power naturally implies and assume that what they're doing is allowed. Batman apprehended an escaped patient and brings him back in, that's fine. Because he's escorted onto the premise, greeted by the commissioner of police, and after the, de the detainee breaks free, he starts chasing him down again, that's completely fine. He's assaulted by loose inmates, so he defends himself physically, that's fine. He continues chasing the escaped inmate, going so far as to start breaking shit, that's fine. He encounters more inmates who he begins to ambush before they attack him, as yet unprovoked, both in the open and with fear. And that's fine, because they've got guns. We know they're bad. He begins giving other staff of the asylum orders and forces them to do as he says, which they do. He's taken a position of power, right? He's Batman. He can do that. That's fine. Eventually, Batman is attacked by manic patients who he throws to the ground, punches so hard that they lose consciousness, and leaves them outside on the ground, concussed in the middle of a freezing New York evening. By that point, by the time the player is asked to be assaulting the very people this institution was built to help, maybe we should be asking more questions about what the power this station we've been handed actually entails, and at what point it is where Batman begins doing things he's been situationally conditioned to think is okay, when out of context, this would be unthinkable. At the start of the game, if you introduce such offensive stereotypes as characters, let alone as hostiles, it would be jarring and upsetting. I don't, I don't know if I can think of something that's a, a, of a single less heroic or even less likable thing for my superhero playable character to be doing than what this is on in a small scale and large scale way. Small being beating mentally ill people, large being acting as an advocate for the way they're summarily treated, housed and abused in this asylum. Both are awful. I shouldn't have to explain why the visual designs of these particular hostiles is degrading and dehumanizing, much less anything else about them, but I might get accusatory on the choice to portray them like this, making them scream, eat rats, wear straps, become beyond perception as a living, breathing person is an effort to counteract the effect that saying the words mental illness should bring to a story. This is a direct attempt to keep the humanity of the story at arm's length, to make it feel as though punching someone with a mental illness in the head isn't as fucked as it is. The only reason these people are so animalistic is so that Batman doesn't look like a monster when he puts them down. The only reason mental health is painted in the way that it is in the game is so that Batman actually looks righteous when he meets a complex human condition with a closed fist. It's just refusing to depict it as a complex human condition. If these characters and their conditions were being represented honestly, this game does not exist. So just so we understand the optics here, the heroism of the character relies completely on a warped perception of illness here. And like in a Stanford prison experiment, that's a kind of warp on your othered enemies that doesn't happen instantly or happen on its own. The game has to take time to introduce these enemies, to build up to them. Batman doesn't even see them right away, much less fight them, and his violent response when they show up seems justified specifically because of his continual run-ins with so many other individual hostiles until that point who are also coded as being mentally ill. If this is the 10, 
on the scale of stigma. We've been fed up one rung at a time. So that things, when they get this twisted, we've been conditioned to think that's the natural progression of the way mental illness is presented in the game. We didn't object to the number one or the number two or the number three on the scale. So that by the time things get this aggressively not okay, nothing actually seems weird. It's been a slow burn. This is the most extreme example of how badly this game might handle it, but it slips past the guard because everything else about how it talks about mental illness and psychiatric hospitals is also just as ignorant, just in less obvious ways that this is eventually built on. It slips past the guard because it's Batman, something that's been in your life for a long time and slowly teaching you something. A property which has been steadily relying on an audience member's willingness to other and demonize and be interested in the brutalization of characters imbued with mental illnesses since the 1970s. It's had some time. And the most obvious caveat to how fully the island and the institution of Arkham is built out is that we get a complete and whole picture of the establishment. This is the only door in the whole of the asylum that we don't ever actually get to see behind. So there's no way the game can imply that there's anything happening off screen. There aren't patients housed elsewhere. There aren't doctors hanging out places we don't go to. As we see it, we're given a comprehensive look at how the asylum operates on an ordinary night. We go to every room we see everything. So we can say pretty safely that this asylum and potentially Arkham as a series kind of doesn't offer a nuanced or sympathetic view of a sentenced patient of a mental institution in a way which shows they could potentially improve with time and help. There's some early in-game dialogue from Quincy Sharp that's very easy to miss. He says that these are patients kept at the asylum that are no longer being considered for release, but I've seen everything on the island. There's no one else here. What I'm saying is there are two kinds of patients at this asylum. You've got named supervillains and these manic lunatics who are kept in the penitentiary. There is nobody else. Nobody's being considered for release. This is an ordinary night. This is the entire scope of what Arkham Asylum believes the spectrum of mental health issues belonging to the criminally insane apparently is. Either you're a complete psychopath or you're beyond control. And in either case, you're gonna get beaten in the head and left to die. And let's think about how dangerous that previous thought about the villains is. These are folks who have some power over Batman in small moments. They make you afraid, right? Killer Croc and Scarecrow sections are notorious. They're very effective at creating that sudden imbalance. It's chilling. The first Scarecrow mission and venturing into Killer Croc's lair are, in my experience, two of the moments that most players remember strongly about this series overall. They always come up. That state of vulnerability and that fear is used as a tool to motivate Batman to fight them. It gives him a reason to do so. Reinforces that what he's doing is right because these people are too powerful. They need to be stopped. They're sadistic, twisted, abusive, unnatural. This guy eats people. What the fuck? Gross. But really, all that the villains in the game are kind of doing is just subjecting different people in the same environment to torture that they've been subjected to for who knows how long while they've been within this asylum. They're turning the tables. They're making someone else feel what they feel. Killer Croc feels hunted and trapped in this asylum, so he makes Batman feel that way. The asylum is a hotbed for people being made to feel like their world and their minds are being manipulated by some sneering demigod, so that's the retribution that Crane naturally seeks from Batman. It's only psychological torture from a bad person if it involves hallucinogenic gas though, not when it's to do with the claustrophobic architecture of the building these people are caged in. It's only cannibalism that's worth responding to when it's Jones who's eating staff or Batman and not other patients. I mean, these skulls came from somewhere, Christ, the number of them. At the very start of the game, Zaz has an Arkham guard strapped into an electric chair, I'm guessing one used for electroconvulsive therapy, but that's used on patients, right? That that's used on patients. And even in regards to Batman's dismantling of the Titan program, on one hand it is to save Gotham from a horde of monsters, but it also happens to be quite a convenient, quiet cover-up for some unconstitutional shit that the asylum was doing, while he later leaves without holding anyone who was culpable for it to account. While it might seem bad faith, given how little Batman actually says about Bane or the experiments or what Titan was doing at the asylum at all, this isn't clear enough. I know it might not be a popular opinion, but I'll say it. Human rights violations are like pretty bad and maybe Batman should, you know, say that. He's also not bothered with the fact that any Titan foes are actually people still. And in order for Joker's plan to be carried out, he needs 
quite a number of people to inject with Titan in the first place. And that means that Joker has a large enough cohort of henchmen to give Titan to to cause Gotham problems. And therefore a large enough group of people agree with what Joker is doing to go along with him as their leader. Is Batman so out of touch? No. It's the hundreds of other people who are wrong. This is a bunch of dominoes, yo. Things be stacking up. They are the prisoners, you are the guards. What you are doing is fine, what they are doing is not, even if you're doing the same thing. And if anything, Batman being asked to step into the role of an asylum inmate should change or affect his perspective on his mission somewhat, or at least give him some level of sympathy for these patients that he's so casually brutalizing. The wrongdoing isn't that Scarecrow is using his fear gas necessarily, it's that he's doing it to Batman. That's the problem with this. Given the chance to confront a man dressed in a weird suit who inspires fear and patience of this building every day, Batman just hands him another one. The difference between Zaz and Sharp, again, two people who've murdered in the name of what they believe to be a higher quest, is that one is rich and one used to be rich. Zaza's fortune is gone, and now his delusion, in cahoots with his poverty, means he's worth fighting. Only having the former means that Sharp isn't worth worrying about. It's only as soon as the inmates fight back and start treating others the way that they've been treated that apparently that's monstrous. Attention! We have an escaped patient! Dresses like a bat! Oh, what an idiot! Should be considered costumed and dangerous. Personally, I think the best solution is to put him out of his misery. It's the only reliable cure. Just look at these manic Batmen in their cages, behaving identically to real people in what's supposed to be the real world. This is apparently horrifying. The person who put Batman into this hallucinatory state is apparently worth fighting, but the ends are the same. The only difference is the target. Interpret the visual language here. It just betrays how horrified Batman is of mental illness. He has no empathy for these patients because deep in his heart, he's scared he could be one of them and wants to crush, hide, destroy that idea as fully as possible. He's scared of something inhuman, something he doesn't understand and doesn't want to be. The asylum itself reduces people to this state that Batman himself is terrified of. And the environmental storytelling says that the secret identity of the character that you play as funds that. Environmental storytelling says that the vigilante mantle of your character has been at this asylum often enough over a period of years to have built a base of operations here in case something went wrong as if things were going to plan before. Shouldn't that say something? Is he silent about that to protect himself or to make it worse on people who he thinks deserve it? And this is where the ideas about Batman being such a flexible character turn around and bite Rocksteady squarely in the ass. Because to me at least, Batman is such a flexible character with such a wide variety of stories and personality types that eventually for a piece of media, I have to insist that it does the hard work itself and clarify exactly who we're telling a story about this time because it could be so many people. There's a certain amount we can presume about Batman going into any one of his stories, and some storytellers, including Rocksteady, generally rely on those pieces of knowledge that they assume we already have to fill in parts of their story that they don't want to tell. Things like his identity, his roles, his rogues gallery, all that. Presuming that an audience member knows a lot about Batman might work for particular aspects. We don't want to see Thomas and Martha Wayne get shot again. We've seen it how many times, but Rocksteady chose to hang a lantern on his no killing rule, for example, so they do show an understanding of uh, character building to an extent. Rocksteady lean on unspoken things like not discussing discussing his origins or motivations particularly well. His relationships with villains or supporting characters can be hand-waved as if a whole bunch of stuff has taken place off screen. If not for the notes in menus and such that his Bruce Wayne billionaire isn't really talked about until over halfway through the game. Branching from that, there's also a lot about the whole Arkham series that relies on the unspoken ideology of Batman as a central thematic element. Ostensibly, the whole finished four games becomes about his and Joker's relationship, from Batman's perspective usually, and the differences in worldview that they have. Arkham often talks about how their natural opposites, yin and yang, chaos and determination, abandon and hope. The Joker represents chaos, and Batman represents justice. It's all very broad, it's all based in nothing, the stories don't say this, they expect you to bring that in with you. 
It's a presumption. Understanding who the Batman and the Joker are within this story relies on either a syncretism of unrelated comics and stuff or on accepting these stereotypes at face value. But I'd argue since Arkham is an accepted interpretation of the entirety of the Batman story, either of those things is reductive. This is a gateway story and should be doing more than hand waving. And if the Arkham series is an accepted interpretation with its own canon, we should prioritize listening to it when it tells us who these characters are and not warping the consumption of the story to sit inside the rules of non-specific, unrelated fictional contexts. In my opinion, navigating the external knowledge of properties like Batman is quite delicate, and it's usually best practice to take the broad presumptions of the characters in unless they're disproved by the story. These are really popular characters, and it's reasonable to assume their most important aspects will be shared across unrelated properties. It's not as though every story should start from nothing, but I do think it's always best to interpret the story that I see in front of me for what it says on its own without relying on the external knowledge because a lot of it isn't going to be important or fit. Employing too much external knowledge into a read of a story also limits the flexibility of the character, something that's core to his appeal. It's a give and take to decide whether external knowledge is being employed in the right ways or in the right doses and the mark of success for me is when I remain emotionally invested in a story even if I don't understand everything that's going on. Something that might my time with select Bioware titles has taught me is completely natural and normal. But for Asylum, specifically when it comes to things as important as Batman's reasons for not killing or what he's hoping to achieve by fighting criminality, it's best to err on the side of caution and, you know, say it out loud so that we know. We assume Batman is trying to get Gotham rid of crime. That's a presumption we bring in with us, but Asylum never actually tells us that while he's doing a whole bunch of stuff that implies more pertinent character information. And likewise, we assume that the Joker is trying to... Well, nothing, right? He represents chaos. He's unpredictable, inexplicable. He's just here to have some fun. Nah, nah. You already know that's not true. It's just easier to pretend he's that way because it justifies Batman more and creates a more, you know, fun way to think about this with the yin and yang thing, but the, it's not what Joker is. He's a definitive something. He has defined characteristics. He's not a wild card. He's not inexplicable. And if we actually listen to him in this game, this read is kind of just straight wrong. In recent years, at least, Joker's character has been upgraded from generally being a wild card with a convenient lack of psychological specificity to being something of a politically charged figure. He was a character who was just a sane, ordinary guy, had a bad day, fell into toxic waste, went crazy because of toxic waste, and then became Batman's greatest rival or something. Now Joker was an ordinary man who struggled under capitalism, in poverty, underfunded innavigable healthcare systems, failing to help him with his ongoing conditions and received so little aid for so long that he snapped and either purposefully or inadvertently became a revolutionary. I know there's a school of thought that likes to say that Joker has many origins and you can never explain what he's about, and you're wrong. If you can never explain him, why do all of his biggest stories do that? The guy has an origin, he has a mission, get over it. Bad faith takes like to paint Joker as a white supremacist, a white terrorist fantasy, and those who see him as aspirational in that light are blatantly ignoring core facts of his most recent popular depictions. This is a character who is theatrical and while maybe severely psychologically troubled in certain interpretations, he is a direct response to long-term abuse and trauma that the disabled and the impoverished suffer under specifically in the US, not necessarily the white. Especially in the Joaquin Phoenix depiction, the upbringing that Arthur Fleck was uh, subjected to and implied child abuse during that time is a common story amongst psychological patients in the US. Child abuse exacerbates trauma and that's, that's a tragically real story. But as with Nolan's films to Bruce Wayne, the Todd Phillips Joker is a complete exploration on Joker's origin creating and elaborating on aspects of the character that any given interpretation of him isn't guaranteed to share. We can't presume that every story shares that same origin in the details, but the ideology? That's a different story. That has more to do with what the character represents in pop culture, the things that transcend the specifics of story and become what we think of associated with that character in general. And because it's such a popular story, an angle for him, 
that's been covered or referenced by many pieces of unrelated media for over a decade now, I would argue Joker today more strongly represents violent anti-capitalist rhetoric than just being inexplicable and crazy. And because Arkham Asylum relies on a presumption of his ideology to explain him, that's the version of Joker I now carry into this game. I'm not really convinced otherwise, and seeing his plans, hearing his dialogue is coming from that kind of figure, dramatically reframes the conflict in this story. Because too many things line up. This isn't an atypical villain. The Joker in Arkham Asylum is kind of a straight up revolutionary fighting in the name of mental health awareness. To point out the brokenness of a health system unequipped to aid its own patients and would rather see them experimented on, caged up and killed than treated. The Joker is someone who understands the futility of negotiation with the power base that he's dealing with and so takes extreme measures to deal with widespread cases of abuse and nigh conspiratorial levels of medical malpractice. I'm not saying the guy's a hero, but I am saying his ideology, as presented in this game, because it's kind of not, isn't one that I'm ready to say at a glance is simple, not worth listening to, or one whose natural opposite is necessarily somebody who's in the right. I see his error in killing people, obviously, but as for the idea of a revolution against Arkham Asylum, I don't really see what's wrong with that, given the conditions that they're forced to be under. The Joker trapping the staff of a broken system, its two leaders and its flag bearer to cut the head off a snake in one fell swoop, whilst bringing attention to how bad things really are to the people of the larger populace by letting loose experiments of that asylum onto the city might be extravagant and comic booky, but it's not irrational. Like, the idea of a revolution is not irrational. You can follow the logic on that because it seems like there's a dystopian guarantee that any amount of mental disorder will force you into institutionalization so brutal that violent rebellion honestly seems necessary and inevitable. And no, neither the Ledger nor Phoenix Jokers are supposed to be irreproachable political ideals in the forms of characters. They both kill people they just don't like. But nuance be damned, we're talking about generalities. The same generalities that a presumed ideological relationship between Batman and the Joker based on off-screen nothing would also bring into a story. If Rocksteady had chosen to tell the story incompletely, which they have, any interpretation of meaning is on the table, even ones that reframe everything. The only fragment of characterization which really calls this read of the Joker into question for me are a few announcements that he makes to his henchmen on the island as to how they should treat the freed patients should they see them out in the open, encouraging his goons to kill them, to put them down. However, since that activity is never actually shown in the game, no confrontation between a prisoner and a patient is ever actually seen, I'm willing to chalk that up to some bad writing sooner than disqualifying the assumption of motivation for Joker that's really only called into question here two thirds the way into the game by missable freaking dialogue. It's not as clear cut as the Joker's the good guy actually. He's not a wonderful man, but on so many fronts, this is a Joker who understands how this system works, knows its pressure points, how to exploit it, and is enjoying tormenting it and not giving it the answers that it wants. He's able to prove corruption on every level of its power structure without a lot of work. He manipulates the warden, the head of research, and a regular guard with relative ease, doing some of that whilst posing as a free benefactor with a ton of money. He's aware that the people running the asylum are spineless, uh, has dirt on them that they seemingly willingly gave up. Really the only one standing in the way of his exposing the extremity of the horrors committed by those in power at the asylum is Batman himself, someone who cannot be reasoned with. Batman is a hair trigger. You can't say anything to the guy. He's He's a freaking Karen about it. And even if we strip away the countercultural aspect of him, the Joker's most popular story, not just origin, but most popular and important story full stop, is The Killing Joke, which set up the core motivation for who and what he is 30 years ago. This is a story that's acted as the basis for many of his following adaptations, and core aspects of it are confirmed by both Arkham Origins and Knight to cross over into Arkhamverse canon, affecting multiple characters so we can pretty safely draw comparisons. This isn't really external knowledge, this is legit a story that's in Arkham itself. The Killing Joke shows a Joker who, violently and ruthlessly to a sickening extent, is seeking empathy from Batman and Jim Gordon people with power within the legal system. Underneath all the bells and whistles about how he tries to dress it up as a grand pursuit. The Killing Joke says something really strong about the Joker's just deep need to be empathized with. 
and the way he chooses to chase that goal, since he believes himself to be stuck in an impossible position, the way he chooses to try and achieve that is to bring people down to his level. He's someone who acts out of a need to be empathized with. That is the Joker. Occasionally that's political, but most of the time it's personal, and you can still draw a lot of comparisons to Batman with that. You can still create the yin and yang relationship that sounds poetic. That he's just a wild card chaotic crazy man is really not a helpful interpretation, and I'll add that it's also boring and stigmatizing of mental health to treat him that way. At least when we cross-reference his spoken motivations in The Killing Joke, The Dark Knight, Joker, and in Arkham Asylum, these iconic, huge Batman stories that millions of people know and have influenced the character for years afterward. What the Joker stands for, his core motivations of bringing more attention to either his own bad situation or the larger mistreatment of the mentally ill, the disabled, the impoverished, to try and force Batman or those in power to see the world through the eyes of someone who is tortured and killed by institutions sworn to treatment, that motivation is undeniably righteous. And playing as Batman in Arkham Asylum is to be given a comprehensive tour of Joker's problems with the health system of Gotham, to have the problems with this institution basically shoved down his throat and still end up blaming Joker for everything that's gone wrong. At a certain moment, simplistic readings of Bruce Wayne are so abundant that they have a goddamn point. But either way, the point I'm making is that in this setting, there are points of incompleteness in the story's discussion of location, history, character motivation that are so substantial from the top down, whether we're talking core characters or NPCs, as well as all of their wider thoughts about the world that, at least for me, go so far beyond the superficial. What a character does and what they don't do is also character information, including what they don't speak out against. Batman doesn't really, at any point, have an emotionally honest conversation with someone at all in the game, much less speak out against patient abuse in the asylum. But Joker's actions means he does. And that says something. That Batman is painted as being absolutely right in the situation, not even a flawed right, but irreproachable, says something as well. Much of that result has to do with story economy being a dominant concern within game design at the time. You know, you gotta, you gotta move it along. You can't spend too much time talking about this sort of flowery shit. But when you place a game in an asylum, you get the meat with the potatoes. These aren't unimportant considerations. We already know you done fucked up saying it's good and fine to abuse the mentally ill. Damage is done there. But the secondary fold of whether or not the villain is actually acting as an advocate for the mentally ill is something worth covering your ass about. Batman is a detective approaching a problem, and that's how a player is asked to consider the situation. The ultimate goal is to catch Joker and stop what he's up to, but at no point is Batman's attention really drawn to what's going on around him, and so neither is mine, and that says something. We have no reason to believe that Batman actually kind of gives a shit about the mentally ill in his city, but we also have enough evidence to maybe come to the conclusion that he's seeking to actively harm them. If someone who eluded diagnosis or any response to treatment like the Joker, is being subjected to that same system by that uncaring Batman, I've really got no reason to believe that the Joker is insane. Why would I take this dickhead at his word? He's just looking to throw some menace into a place that will actively psychologically and physically harm him on Batman's behalf. Again, I don't think it's as simple as the Joker's the good guy actually, but is Batman? I think that is a discussion worth having here because I don't think he is at all. I certainly don't feel it when I play. Do I feel like a hero? No, I feel powerful. That's not the same thing. Do I feel like Batman? Maybe. Maybe. Joker's supposed insanity isn't rooted in a solid enough diagnosis, a named one or by any exhibited symptoms, to kind of noticeably tarnish the nobility of his professed mission, or to make the way that he's treated by Batman or by these systems seem honestly justified. This is a man who, when asked, kind of tells you what he's doing, who has a rationale behind it that when you look at all the environmental factors, it makes complete sense. He doesn't hear voices. He doesn't receive visions, or at least we're not told that. He could be insane. That's a possibility. But I can definitely conclude that he's observing injustices, ones I can see, and responding in a fashion that he feels is right. If his mission is to draw attention to the plight of the mentally ill in Arkham Asylum, that's a sympathetic goal, even if he's a murderer about it, because the people he's fighting 
are a hell of a lot worse. If Batman is allowed to remain a blunt, simplistic response to that nuanced motivation in fighting Joker and in refusing to engage on that same narrative level, Batman's mission becomes to oppress the mentally ill of Gotham. It's what this is. Arkham Asylum is only a functional, fine, okay story if you as a player bring in knowledge about Batman's ideology that the game never gives you reason to believe he actually has and believe in it so strongly that you willfully ignore how fully his actions in this game and in what he refuses to speak out against blatantly contradict what we think that he's about and if all that needs to happen is to write Batman better give him some character so be it at least it stops the possibility that Batman is just the final guardian of systemic suppression in its trap that's probably something important to clarify. Look, I know that I'm throwing a lot at the wall here on top. I, I do think we all can see that the portrayal of mental illness in this game is very obviously outdated in some ways. And I'm just putting out there that maybe there is there's some significant shit going on with Batman 2. Uh, it's a conversation that I'm trying to start. I don't know if I have a real conclusion with this. What I, what I say is that Batman is a man who says nothing in the face of insurmountable evidence of a staggering amount of patient staff abuse, uh, a backward outdated asylum with no real results, who in turn aids and abets and joins in on that abuse. Because what I, I talked about how haunting the buildings are, right? It's been talked about for years how atmosphere is Asylum's strongest aspect, how it works to freak you out, how medieval some of these instruments look. Did, did we just forget to interpret that? Narratively, ask what that says. I, I don't think we forgot. I think it's terrifying. Because it is terrifying. How could a game story so insidious still be so much fun. I haven't wanted to think about that. Playing this game again, it is incisive. At most moments, it might appear as though the story is going in a very specific direction where Batman's journey exposes the deep systemic failings on part of the asylum, and he's gonna have a reaction to it at some point. On a good day, this would look like him building a case, gathering a whole bunch of info, and at the end of the game, having enough evidence to lock a few affluent people up as well. On its face, not all of this is against the game. It would actually be pretty great in a certain way if the ending was different. To show Batman discovering all of this for the first time, slowly realizing where he's been sending these people to, what's really going on here, and just repent and expose it and really enact some some justice, you know? It's not really a problem that the game presents these issues in this setting. I reckon it's actually that spreading awareness of some of this stuff is probably quite necessary. The problem is that Batman apparently already knows about all of this. His mission is to maintain it, to not deal with it, to get in there and get his own hands dirty in making this worse, to take a look at how this place treats and categorizes mental health and sign off on it. It perpetuates stereotypes. It acts as a force for demonization. That the game doesn't use overt violence, it isn't buried under a tide of blood and guns and gore, doesn't really mean that this isn't dystopian levels of dark. It means it's kind of in denial. Denial of what psychological violence is and the dramatically different kind of weight that that can bring to a story. A guy getting shot in the head isn't nearly as chilling as someone getting in his head and messing around in it. And thinking about how casually this game seems to imply or employ the most depressing kinds of spiritual and emotional violence to tell its garbage story is pitiful. It's childish. I once called the ending of this game neat and satisfying. Seeing it how I do now, there's actually something really smug about it. The guy worked all night witnessing horrors untold about how the people of his city are treated by his city, got to hear, see the accounts of how the mentally ill in his city feel they are treated, and he broke so little sweat in keeping them down that it's just all in a day's work? Because of the station that Batman fulfills, the one the player is asked to step into, is one of ultimate power, his indifference and lack of focus on what the institution itself is doing becomes an act of condonement to fictionalized versions of the most realistic horrors the medical world has seen in the past century. The painful thing is that Arkham Asylum aligns so closely to actual 
real world barbarism and how past societies have handled, stigmatized, treated those with addictions, psychological disorders, psychosis, that it can be read through the lens of modern psychological studies in both fictional and meta ways means that it is a strong, well thought out game in a lot of ways. Of course it is. It offers an anachronistic view on what health facilities might look like if we still built places the way we did 150 years ago in the modern day, and it is frightening. And it is valuable to know how far we've come, and important to see the areas in which we're able to improve by using Arkham Asylum as a lens to look at mental health institutions of today. But I'm not going to mark that in the pro column, because it's not calling anything out, it's just doing it. It's just simplistic. It's not discussing mental health demonization, it's just demonizing. If Arkham Asylum is taking the stance that Batman takes, which has to be assumed, then the game infers that basically any mental illness is extreme enough to inevitably lead to violent behavior in the individual. That that individual should be ostracized from society until any and all of their illnesses are fixed with processes that they're not allowed to speak out against. And that if they aren't fixed quickly enough, which they won't be, they'll eventually go so far off the rails that they'll be indistinguishable from animals and deserve to die. There's a fun game about that. And that has to be inadvertent. It might just be entertainment, but the spirit of that matters. That matters. The spirit says that the least fortunate people among us, the people who... Like, really terrible things have happened to these people. The game is saying that they kind of deserve what they get, that understanding them is useless because they defy normalcy, and they don't take their medicine because they're in my way. I would now call the ending of this game sickening in all the many ways that this Bruce Wayne would hate. The patients of the asylum are just rounded up, tossed back into their literal cages to continue losing a grip on language, reality, society, without a hope of release or improvement. And apparently this is the way it's supposed to be. Those who were othered were definitely the bad guys. The prisoners were definitely bad. Those who were situationally conditioned to believe needed to be in their cells, needed to get back in their cells. Those who the player's role as Batman says are beneath you really are beneath you and really were in the wrong. There's nothing hard about this. There's no lessons to learn. Everything was as it appeared to be. These are supposed to be people. If you suffer from a serious psychological disorder, this is what the game thinks of you. And this is what Batman thinks that you deserve. I know that people have talked about how mental health and incarceration is represented in this game before, but I think the precise issue that I'm seeing is that more discussion about Arkham Asylum isn't concerned with it today. It should be a major aspect of how we remember it. I think how we wrestle with its use of stigma should be front and center in how we talk about its value as a modern game today. It's not impossible to have both. I'm not trying to condemn this. I just want to recognize that this is what's going on. And the longer we wait to take a good hard look and the longer we continue to advertise this game as being for everybody, the longer these stigmas continue and the more people are potentially hurt. Arkham Asylum kind of isn't just a game that's out of date because of the people by whom it was made, the media to which it's tied or was inspired by, and the energy that it emits, the game can be presented as evidence that Batman on whole and Batman's stories relies on a hateful, ignorant, persecutory view of the mind and spreads a harmful misunderstanding of mental health or psychology because this game has been and will remain an accepted interpretation of his universe and a full-on gateway into it. How many stories does that implicate? I have to believe that a lot of this was accidental. I have to think that a lot of the people at Rocksteady just didn't really know the full extent of what they were doing here. I have to believe that the past 12 years of advancement in mental health awareness and progression in media representation of these stories has been more significant than Rocksteady understood at the time 
and that it was just a big team who wanted to make a fun action game and weren't thinking about it too hard. I wonder if they'd make this today. I really don't know, because they're not fucking making anything today. Rocksteady are a studio who, at least at the time, like to focus on their strengths. They like to make sure what's good is so good that... I didn't notice that what's bad is so bad that it hurts. Arkham Asylum might as well be an argument for the case against perfectionism in terms of design, but for narrative, it's the very picture of unintended consequences. That this game for more than a decade has been held up as a pure example of licensed storytelling for games as an almost infallible, field-changing moment is at the very least telling of how little scrutiny it's really actually faced. You move past all the droll, dead horse conversation about how so-called influential the game is and what it has to say, what's actually here is really, really ugly. When I get past the cloud of hysteria that surrounds it, and I actually look at the thing, I just see a really misguided video game. Because at the end of all the technicalities, all the fictional loopholes I have to jump through, putting all of that aside, one broader concept still holds true to me, one that's taken me years to learn. And it's on the knowledge that I've gained in how game stories are conveyed through their chosen tools of engagement, the most centrally. How they convey feelings through their tools, their tone. The most effective means that a game has to impart meaning is how I engage with it. That's not just interactivity, it's the emotion that that tactility evokes and needs from me to operate. And unless it can be safely said that there are tools of engagement in the way that Arkham Asylum is designed, which aim to specifically draw it out of me, try to get the exact emotion out of me, is there any sense of empathy for the ill in Batman's outlook? And maybe this persists all series long, but I don't know if it can be said that a game story, which doesn't use design to uh, talk about core parts of it, has succeeded at all. I only have to deal in story for so long. At a certain point, what's being implied by this game is down to how I engage with it. And as Batman, I am called to see all as hostile or benign. There isn't an in-between. The tools of engagement this game affords me convey so many different ways to harm and to feel power, to discover, to track down, to scare, and so few to reach out and to understand and to help. And it's an important side of this hero, of any hero, that Arkham Asylum utterly fails to consider conveying. Design is story. That this game's largest agreed upon failings are boring boss fights is entirely disproportionate to the level of praise this game has received. That Arkham Asylum can all at once be taken so seriously and yet not seriously at all is alarming. What do we mean when we say this game's great? Because we should just be saying that it's fine. There's a definitive failing here and it's in its failure to seize the opportunity to contribute meaningfully to a conversation about mental health and psychiatric institutions. Talk about systemic suppression of the sick, on ableism or modern cultural thoughts on disability, to try and raise awareness to the struggles that state hospitals faced and continue to face in modern America. And I mean very particularly what I say there, the definitive failing is that it doesn't take that opportunity that it's actually saying things that are much worse is just extra. Hopefully this all feels like less of an indictment, an unhinged criticism or flaying, and more of an attempt to update what, what I think of Arkham Asylum, an attempt to start that conversation that we've been scared of. I'm in no way an expert in a lot of this. There's a lot of angles to this conversation that I haven't covered, but at least it's a different conversation. It's not helpful to cancel a game and say that none of it was great, a lot of this was and remains solid, but there is a need to reassess in new contexts and in no way does a game like this release today and not get torn to shreds for exactly these reasons. Maybe you like Arkham Asylum because you were already on its side. It didn't have to convince me of anything when I first picked it up. I just thought it was cool. It's, it's Batman. You know, it's cool. But we ask more from our games in this today. More from our entertainment, especially when they deal with mental health. That bar is so much higher. We ask that they say something that can resonate with part of the human spirit that they convey emotion, meaning, hope, that people with these diseases in real life will feel seen and represented and respected. And Arkham Asylum is an effective game at conveying fear and dread and power. Entirely missing the other side of that spectrum is important. People's relationships to Batman can be as complicated as they are personal. This is a game that unlocked a lot for me. I'm not seeking to destroy that. There are allowed to be levels to this. Conflict 
in this case, I don't think it's something to avoid. It's worth navigating. But I, I would challenge anyone who says of themselves, as I have, that they're a fan of this series to try taking Arkham as seriously as we claim to in the bits we've been ignoring. We can have a lot of conversations from a lot of valid points of view about what responsibilities Rocksteady may or may not have had when writing this story. We can talk about how attitudes toward these stories have advanced in the past decade. While they might not have believed, as you may not, that their story had a need to be realistic, I, I personally don't want to stand by this game, really, anymore. I don't want to say that it's great. I, I don't even really want to say that you should play it, because there's... I just... That makes me sad, but I, I, I don't feel that would be right. But something I hope we can agree on was this story's potential. There are exceptionally few properties of this size that can discuss psychiatry and disability while reaching this wide and receptive a potential audience. Batman as a property is one of the very few places where deep looks into the minds of the mentally ill isn't just expected, it's basically guaranteed. And in continuing to accept interpretations that demonize, like Arkham Asylum, so many real stories from so many marginalized people that have the power to help real people in the real world and really get seen, can be swept to the side in favor of watching contortions of them get hosed and sedated just because we don't want to think about it. Batman is a character who invites this kind of read, where someone who wants to do more than just make a popcorn flick is given the opportunity to use a comic book property, one of the most popular in the world, to deal with topics that are so rarely given the world stage. It's important work when you take it. While I'll dissect Batman and the, the stories of him that fail, at the end of it, I will fiercely stand by the potential of this property to meaningfully discuss things that are extremely important and to open the door for new audiences into deeper thinking, to create visibility to the actual struggles facing real people today in, say, psychiatric hospitals, whether they work there, whether they're being treated there, have a family member there. These places exist and there are stories there that deserve to be told and to be heard, and Batman is a place in which they belong and would be heard, a place where these stories are really truly wanted. We like to wear our crown as having the best superhero games belong to our favorite character, because we do, and we love it. And we bend over backwards to remind people how important these games apparently are. But we hold games of today to certain standards of purpose, of meaning, and Arkham can't be exempt from that just because it came too early, or just because it's Batman and we love it without it needing to really try. We understand that games dealing with these themes today need to be better than Arkham Asylum is at actually saying something, and it's made all the more stark a failing to me because this is Batman, a character who truly can be and often is so much better than this, so much more inspiring, so much more human. I'm finding the difference. All it really requires is a more perceptive eye and an audience member who is ready to be more discerning than I was. I want to look past the paint job and the so-called legacy. I, I can try to enjoy this. But what do I really mean when I say this game is great? Because I should just be saying that it's fine. It's fine. Calm down, buddy. It's fine. I visited Aradale, which is a closed mental hospital in Ararat, about two hours from Melbourne, where I live. It's had several names, from Ararat Lunatic Asylum to Ararat Hospital for the Insane, but it's called Aradale now, because the local government at some point thought that having Lunatic Asylum next to the name of their town brought a level of stigma. They, they held a local contest and a woman won five guineas for suggesting Aradale. I have no idea what a guinea is, but 
You Go Girl. Arrowdale was constructed between 1865 and 67 and operated as a hospital for the mentally ill, something of a jail and a training center for those with intellectual disabilities until 1993. The place is really huge, like seriously massive. The tour I was on took about two hours and we apparently only saw about 15% of the complex. It was initially planned to hold up to 320 patients, but at its peak housed closer to a thousand with several hundred on-site staff in addition. What's even more astounding is that almost all of it was built in just two years. They took the top off a hill, they built the walls, buildings, wards, kitchens, all of it in just two years, much of it using what's tantamount to slave labor. And while the upkeep is in question, this is not a ruin. It's still a really sturdy set of buildings. I could see summer camps being held at worse places. I've been to a few. This one particular hall here had some amazing acoustics in there. I'd love to play or listen to live music in that in that hall. But the reason this place was so full a lot of the time was due to the gold rush in rural Australia when it was built, bringing in lots of business, making Ararat a real center for commerce, and it, along with Kew and Beechworth, housed the sites of three significant uh, correctional facilities in Victoria. This was a place for almost anyone with a mental illness, a small one or serious or violent or otherwise, to be sent from almost anywhere in the country, with certain wards of it being used as prisons throughout the entirety of its operating years. This was just a place where you could put people. There was a wide spectrum of the kinds of people who were housed here, from the elderly and infirm to children as young as 10 who would stay here for the whole of their lives. Toward the end of its operating years for the right patients, it was also something of an open facility where people would sleep and eat and be treated here, but would go out into town during the day. It was so full during its peak because of the kinds of illnesses that people were experiencing then were so common now. They were largely things we can treat or understand much better today. Things like anxiety, post-traumatic stress, postnatal depression, things that you'd almost never commit someone to a long-term facility to treat for potentially the rest of their life. A lot of people with illnesses like that were sent here to a facility. There are at-home treatments and much better drugs to deal with what Arrowdale was kind of targeting. For everyone else, those who do require 24-hour care or patients who are violent and dangerous, the nature of Arrowdale is well past being able to offer the kinds of amenities that people who need that kind of care would benefit from. These rooms are scarily tiny. You'd have to start from scratch. The way it's built would actually make their lives more difficult. It was a, it was a mix of stories there. On one hand, you'd hear something endearing and hopeful, like the, the children of a former staff member uh, visiting the site again as adults, talking about how much fun they had or how all the patients there were their friends. And on the other, there were as many as eight babies born on the site with the very first of those children born to an unmarried nurse who worked in the chief psychiatrist's home. Uh, that child was actually sent to a workhouse in Melbourne and no one knows what happened to that young boy. For every pleasant anecdote, there was another equally as real story contrasted. This is a room in which as many as 22 male patients slept and called their homes for pretty much the entirety of their stays. 22 men all in the same room not a second of privacy. There is a morgue. The whole of Arrowdale was actually built before the use of refrigeration. Some refrigerated slabs for cadavers were built later. We were told that these actually still worked and had been used by the local hospital at some point recently uh, in the event of an emergency. There was plenty to know and plenty that we heard about the good and bad of life within the walls, but visiting Arrowdale had me thinking about more of those sorts of mundane considerations than I'd ever thought of for a facility like this. These are the kitchens. This is a deadly looking machine that was actually used to make cutting vegetables in bulk happen faster. These are steam drums to cook the food with the steam holes for ventilation over the top. Every piece of meat on the site was from an animal who was born, raised and butchered on the site in the kitchen and refrigerated there too. Arrowdale was powered by a large boiler which used anything from wood to generate steam power to diesel to fuel the entire complex. But certain buildings didn't have heating or lighting for years after they were built. Gas lamps were the best you were doing. The place would have been dark and cold and smelled awful. Patients didn't have money with which to purchase their own clothes and laundry facilities were constantly busy. Patients didn't have their own belongings or things like mirrors until well into the 20th century. The two tallest structures on the site are actually both water towers. Rainwater was collected from the roofs all over the complex, went through down pipes, 
into an underground system which was then pumped into the towers. The tour we were on wasn't wheelchair accessible, despite many patients of Aradale being physically disabled as well as mentally ill while they stayed there. Thinking about the easy to overlook necessities of everyday life in one of these places was what really stood out to me. How do you feed, clothe, shower, and keep the lights on for a thousand people every day? Operate and run a facility of this size just to house a massive group, much less accommodate and care for each of their individual needs, which is after all, what the place is there to do. A facility like Aradale was built by people to offer solutions of that time as they knew them to illnesses we now understand much more completely. It is from many kinds of angles, not just architecturally, but medically, a very outdated place. Besides the history, there isn't really a need for Aradale anymore, I don't think. And as time went on, it came to resemble much more of a geriatric hospital or aged care facility than what it originally was. And it's very poorly equipped for that kind of task. The younger patients with the ailments the place used to treat were able to fight a lot of their battles outside in the free world, and those who were left to care for became older and older. But Aradale was only closed in 1993. This is an ancient history to anybody. The memories of when Aradale was operational are still very fresh in the, the minds of the people of Ararat, patients who were housed there or staff who worked there or people who visited or knew of it while it was operational, still very much alive and will be for a long time. This is closer than you'd think. As it was originally dubbed, Aradale Lunatic Asylum was still operational three years before I was born. When it was shut down, it was a significant blow to the local economy, which lost hundreds of jobs overnight. In the time since, Aradale's been assessed by people who might want to do something with the land and buildings, which was left open to vandals after it was shuttered. It's looked after as best as possible by a small team now. There's a vineyard there operated by a local vocational school, which makes wine, which they import to China. And there are tours through sections of the facility uh, two days a week. On the hill overlooking a third of that vineyard on its edge, just next to the driveway up to what was the front entrance. Aradale has one of the most confusingly beautiful views I've seen in rural Australia. It almost feels like an accident that it's so gorgeous. You're on the top of a hill with a golf course on one side, a clear blue sky and green green grass stretching out to a pair of mountains but there's a bunch of palm trees in the way there's what remains of a five and a half meter tall wall which was built nearly 200 years ago to keep patients inside this isn't a manicured it's not an intentionally wonderful view but it is breathtaking sitting on that hill is a small metal spinning star not unlike something that you'd see in a children's playground much like the palm trees it seems entirely out of place there had been kids in Aradale, but this was the only thing on the whole of the complex that I saw which looked specifically built to play on. Our tour group was actually starting to walk away before someone else pointed at it and asked what it was. Is that for kids? They asked. The tour guide actually shook his head and said, well, no. But there were some patients here who were at the mental age of children, so they would come out here and have a bit of fun. 